Hey, hey, welcome back, What's everybody. Happening? What's happening? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. That's, he literally unless told you pay, me. Unless you got a bag of money sitting waiting. Hey, he literally you. told me to that going. face, he is not going back to Tulsa, Oklahoma. There's no way in the world you're going to get him back. Um, first of all, um, I want to say I feel sorry, and my heart goes out to brothers and sisters living in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I feel like Tulsa, Oklahoma is what Jim Crow felt like uh, week number three. It feels so like there's a million people, right? A million people in Tulsa. Four hundred thousand of them are black, and you see nobody downtown. It's almost it feels like a city where it's 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 racial suppression. Business can be suppressed through racism. Um, um, the, the value of diversity it enhances rich competition. Mm-hmm. Through the rich competition the best will rise and we all benefit from it, right? So like say you open up a black cafe and you mediocre and a white cafe opens up across the street and they smack you in the face and they take your business. You can complain about racism all you want, but you had to suck. Because folks don't just go, who are your coffee? You know, there'll be a very small portion of the market that's going to switch because of race. But most people are focusing on themselves, not others. Mm-hmm. And so we spend our money to please ourselves most of the time over others. And so what competition does is that um, entrepreneurs know that if you get beat, it's a lesson. It's not a statement. Of we, it's a lesson for us. And when you get beat in competition, that means you gotta go back and practice or change your strategy. Mm-hmm. And so there, you, what you saw was market, market isolation where, okay, you could be the business over here by yourself, you could be the business of this over by yourself. And so they were celebrating mediocrity, me, mediocrity, right? And so what we saw was uh, the food sucked everywhere we went. 
the hotels food sucked horribly. Um, a lot of service sucked everywhere we went. I mean, it was so bad. Shopping sucked. I was like, what the hell is this, right? But the division, black folks was like, hey, we don't go on that side of town. White folks was like, we don't go on that side of town. That, that separation, like, think about this. When you say a million people, you think New York. You go to New York, it's popping. Like, I don't know if you have been. You go to New York, any, look, get there at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's popping, right? But also look at New York's competition is real. If you don't perform in New York, goodbye, right? And so just to see how, you know, a lot of people are arguing diversity based upon tokenism, right? Like, you know, like I want to tokenize a gay person. Like this one gay guy came to me. He's like, yo, Nana. You know, he walked up to us. He's like, yo, what's up, brothers? He said, like, I'm from Oakland. He said, yeah, I'm from Oakland too. He goes, he goes, by the way, I'm a queer. And I laughed in his face. I said, what the fuck you said for? I'm looking at you. Like, you, you got a, you got a, you got a, uh, the rainbow mask on. Like, you got fingernails every color. You got on a sheer shirt. But no dude, straight dude wears a sheer shirt. There's just no reason, right? With nothing underneath it. I said, but here's the thing. Are you cool or not? Because what I'm not going to do is treat you the way white, white people treat you, which is you say you're queer and you become a celebrity amongst them. Nah, you cool or not. Because I don't give a shit about your sexual preferences. What I do care about how you're going to show up. Right? And he, he was shocked as fuck. He's like, okay, I ain't never heard that answer before. But it's like because you're not used to being seen, you're used to being tokenized. Same thing with black folks when you get jobs in white corporate America. They tokenize you. They don't see you. Don't want, they don't say, hey, you're black, so you have a unique black experience. Can you bring your creativity, your innovation, the way you see the problem to the table, which will enhance the way the team sees the problem? What they say is, yes, we fill the seat. We have somebody black over there. Hey, yes, look, come on now. Got a, we, got a, we got an Asian person here. We got a Latino person here. We got, a, we got somebody from the LGBTQ plus community from there. It's not seeing people. That's just shitty. And then I also wrote, I, I, I raised a question. If Do you like everybody in your family? He says, no. I said, do you love everybody from your city? He says, no. So how in the fuck are you supposed to like everybody's gay? There's going to be some gay people I really, I really like, and there's going to be some gay people I'm like, I don't really give a shit about you, bro. Fuck off, right? Because that's when you see a people, you get, then you start to see the diversity, and you start to appreciate your particular selection of diversity. It doesn't mean that you wake up in the, more, to more, in the middle of the morning and go, for all people I don't like, I'm just going to have a pitchfork. I'm going to go just protest against them. That's not what the fuck I'm saying. But there is a merit-based system when it comes to human relationships. Like, I don't hang out with crackheads. Sorry. Them motherfuckers rob too hard. Right? They just they go too hard in the paint. And so it ain't in my interest. Now, the, if the crackhead says, hey, man, I feel unseen and you don't value me, I'm going to shrug my shoulders and keep walking because, motherfucker, I don't. At the end of the day, there's a message we have to send to people is that the experience you're having with others is causation is because how you're showing up to those relationships. If you have a lot of negative experiences with people, it's how you're showing up. If you have a lot of great experiences with people, it's how you're showing up. You dictate your friendships, your circles, the way the world treats you, the way the world smiles at you. But when you get caught up in this whole new game of pointing fingers, you take away the most powerful power you have, which is changing itself. Right? If you're in a relationship right now and the person talks to you like shit, you, you give permission for that person to talk to you like you ain't shit. Because I promise you, that person don't talk to everybody like they ain't shit. I can promise you that. Because they get smacked. Or some people just will dismiss them. Or some people won't give them the time of day. And they'll shape up to receive that time of day. So how we are being treated in life, I think it's a crime um, to focus on victimization when we have so much power in our own hands. Um, but with that being said... I'm, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't know how to be superficial. It's, it's kind of hard. Even when I'm telling jokes, to, I have a deep thought in my, in my mind. But I want to say this. I want to make an announcement. So next month, as you guys know, um, me and Court had a dope-ass dialogue. So um, before me and Court talked on the plane, there was this thing that was itching. And I always said since day year two that I wanted to remove hope from the mental connection or the branding of the self-help culture. I don't want this. This is not a self-help thing at all. And one of the things that by talking to court, and we both agree upon this, and of course you can elaborate at any point to kind of chime in, um, is we agree that 
what bothers me the most about self-help is the quality of the thinking of the people who participate. So this again, the quality of the people thinking who participate. I'll give you an example. If this room was filled with Harvard students, your conversation would be of a certain level. But this room was filled with landmark students, it would be of a certain level. And I told court, I want us to hold ourselves responsible by the quality of y'all conversation. And if and what, what does that mean to me? That means that when you guys are speaking, do you contextually own these ideas or are you just bring these ideas up to raise your status amongst your peers? Can you command this knowledge as it's yours or are you looking at us as gurus, like we have some insight that you can't have? Are you reading books by people worshiping certain authors, whether they are um, uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman or Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or Tony Robbins? Are you worshiping these people and going, oh, man, I love what they say? Or are you seeking the knowledge, their, their, their source of knowledge? So there's a couple of things that we I, I wanted to change this year, and, and we're kicking it off. You know, so Court had to prime you guys, and he just did some amazing priming, and that's some of the feedback also I received from people. They, they appreciate the priming. But we're committing to not teaching but transferring. So teaching still implies that we're the teachers. Transferring is making you guys the teachers, the leaders. So one, we want to commit to transferring knowledge. Uh, Two, I want to commit to making sure, sure you guys own the source. I don't want you guys overvaluing or worshiping anybody as if they're special or unique. Everybody in this room is special, unique. There's no, the only difference between maybe Court and I to maybe somebody in this crowd is the time we put in, the practice time we put in, right? But once you put your practice time in and you learn these same principles, then you're competing at this. You're competing at greater levels than we're competing right now, right? But the 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 worshiping of individuals are to think that there's some super hidden secret that I, like some box that I'm opening up every weekend and I'm looking in and I'm pulling out a lesson and dropping out on y'all and they put it back in the box for later on. That's not how it works. Is what you're hearing when me and course sit in front of you is a lot of practice, right? So, which leads to my other point. So, Tanil was doing her due diligence. It was like, Nana, where's the podcast? Nana, where's the podcast? We're off for two weeks. Where's the podcast? I'm starting to have a problem with podcasts. Now, I like them, I like them a little bit of podcasts. But podcast dependency is making me a little nervous. Because I never had podcast dependency. But I started seeing there was a podcast dependency starting to brew in this class. The problem with podcast dependency is you're not owning context. I was just talking to my brother Josh over here, my Jewish brother Josh. I like to do that when it wasn't my Jewish brother Josh over here. Jewish brother Josh. Um, and I was hollering at him saying, there's a cost for whatever you want in life. You got to pay a fee. There's a cost to whatever you want in life. This is a cost. And too many of us are trying to negotiate and budget our way to the top. There's a cost. Anytime you want to go somewhere, there's a fee for that shit. You don't get to go any, there's nothing for free. And for some reason, there's folks who have told, I've said this in class and this podcast I put out in the past, I said, the most valuable investment you can make is information. And so many of us are trying to negotiate that cost. And so we try to, we try to, we try to shrink it, compress it, reduce it, take it in fast to a podcast. Mind you, it's not your fault. You're not, it's not because it's not, it's not of ignorance. It's because your brain doesn't like to burn resources on anything that doesn't have to burn resources on it. So it likes to take the shortcut every chance it gets. But unfortunately, you got to pay a cost. And the cost is sometimes you need to read a particular book. So when you learn a principle, you can learn how that principle shows up in so many different ways, which enhances your decision making, which also enhances your control over the things you do have control over. Right? Like life is life is like an ocean, right? But at the end of the day, a surfer needs to have some technique. 
there is a negotiation of technique and the unpredictable occurring, right? And quite often when we listen to podcasts, we're getting all these cool little points and highlighted points. But if I was to test you next week on how to use these points in the real world, you don't have that context for proper application. This is where the self-help goes wild with. They give you all these cool ideas, and if you consume them, you can repeat them back, and you look really impressive. But if somebody hits you in the mouth, you have no fucking technique. The death comes from sitting with a single one, two, three, four, five ideas, diving into that idea, and looking at this application in di within different um, uh, scenarios, from different perspectives, um, also understanding the variables that allow that principle to work. And if those variables change, you not you don't apply the same principle. So, for example, historically, you may say, somebody may say, well, Martin Luther King said, and I said, what the fuck did you tell me that for? There's so many things have changed since Martin Luther King made that original quote or statement. Those original ideas don't exist anymore, right? And so for, for, so for somebody to say, Martin Luther King said, well, we didn't have the internet then. Cost of living was different. Transportation was different. Cell phones exist. Economic changes happen. 9-11 happened. Uh, uh, recession. There's so much, right? And so when you quote something historically and don't take into account all the changes and then you try to apply that strategy today, it's a flawed strategy. The strategy has external impacting factors that make the strategy relevant. But you're not going to learn that from podcasts often. Because podcasts, not that they're wrong, not that they're bad, but they're not moving like that. They're not moving for them to dig. They dive into a little bit, but they, but once you learn more about those principles, you realize, oh, shit, this principle that I kind of like was a speed bump for me back here was actually the life changer for me. But I didn't know that because when the person presented it, the angle they presented it from and how they use it in the discussion didn't seem relevant to you. So you have to learn principles way freaking deeper than that. So um, <clears throat> what I plan on doing is well, there's a there's a pot, there's a book that uh, I've been going. I, man, I got so many books I read, but there's a particular book that I want us to treat like a podcast. I want you guys to purchase it as an audio book. Okay, the book is called The Psychology of Money. It's five hours long. That's four weeks of podcasts. This is, two hour, this is an hour a week. If you can't give an hour a week to yourself, then the reason you're not performing well in your life is not because uh, white people are hella big and they got big muscles and they, they run with the X-Men. The reason you're not performing well is because you don't spend no time investing in yourself. So the psychology of money is necessary because if I taught that book alone, that would take me to December. But the book is written well enough where you can grasp it. Every week when you come, you write your questions down. And I expect to hear some questions from you like, hey, what do you mean by this? It is not written like an accounting book. The, 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 the premise of this book is this. Too many of us look at money from X's and O's and from a mathematical angle. Money is psychological. Investments are psychological. Business is psychological. It is not X's and O's. Matter of fact, there's a dude, the Wall Street Trapper. Everybody's, no, 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 no. This happened last year when I put out the, the podcast, Wall Street Trapper. No, 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 no. I want to make, make investments. I'm like, no, you're not ready. You're not ready for that. People looked at me like, what? what? Because being an investor is a psychological shift. It's a different state of mind. If you get to investment coming from poverty in your current state of mind, not in the psychology of money, then you're a mark. I'm about to just take your money. You're, like, you just, you just, you're, you're fluffing the industry for, us to, for, the, for the players to play. Um, psychology, you got to go into psychology with the right mindset and understand the principles of how to think about money that I promise you most of you guys have never heard of. And these things that me, so I would almost argue that I don't think, not, I think me and Court have covered a lot of principles of, of psychology of money, but this book does an excellent job of dressing everything that surrounds money, how we think, success, how we feel about it, our principles, but it's written so, and it's, and it's covering some heavy books. Like, it's taking some of the heaviest books I've read and suppressed it and simplified it and boiled it down where it's transferable to you. But it's, I promise you, it's on some deep ass principles. It's, a, it's full of masterful, deep psychological business life principles um, that are crazy insane. If you read that book, 
let me just give you one warning. You're not going to be the same again. I promise you that. Never going to be the same again. You're going to have some serious questions about your choices, your life, how you move forward, how you feel. It's going to change. It's going to challenge you from your optimism to your perception of the world to how things work. Many of us are thinking about money, but only thinking about life from the day we were born forward. Not understanding where, where did this come from? What was this? What was that? Like, we don't, we don't even think about, like, you know, 1950, what were people thinking about money? Because that was the size of a house. How did money move? How long has 401k, 401k been here? The investment game, how long have people been actually making money from that? What's a, what's a bull market? What's a bear market? How's that relevant to me? How do I know I'm not part of a bubble right now, which you are? You're in a, you're in a, you're in a bull bubble market. That's why when you talk to other people, oh, you got to get in the market because there's all this money is popping. That shit happens in seasons. The bear market's going to come. Right? And then how do you make money in the bear market? But it puts it in a common man language that you can understand. And I, trust me, I'm you. So when I say you, I can hear and go, yeah, this, this, I can talk like this on a corner and folks can translate these ideas. Right? But I want to start moving us towards material in addition to the, what we're going to be doing in class so we can transfer this knowledge to you. I don't want... The reason, guys, the gurus and the... the, the, the um, Teachers shape the brand that they are the geniuses and they're here to give you a lesson because it's an industry. When money comes to the game, the principles change. When the money comes into the game, the principles change. Just like on television, when money comes to the game, the principles change. Just like news, when it comes to the game, the principles change. So if me and Court decided we wanted to make money off of this, which we don't, we make most of our money. We make 99.9.99% from our investments in our businesses. We don't make no money from this. But if we decided we want to make money from this, not only do we know what to do, but Court even got some, he, Court even knows the magic tricks. All the little games we could play on you and have you guys be like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing in the world. And for $5,000, we can get you ready for the, and guess what? We can fill up 10 of these classrooms in minutes. Because a lot of those classes are designed to go after some of your human urges, some of your horrible perception of how the world works and your current positions in life. But court signed up as well as I signed up to create entrepreneurs. Because by having entrepreneurs, once again, I don't play the victim game, I play the solution game. And entrepreneur is a solution-based animal. They don't run around talking about what's wrong with the world. Fo they, they focus on how can they have impact in this world? And so you're going to learn so many things from causations to compounding to um, the map is not the terrain, the barbear theory, but they're going to break it down so simple that you're like, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And then after that, we'll, I'm like, after we finish these five, these, this, so that's a month, a month and a week I give you guys to finish this one book. I'm going to have another book to follow up behind that book. But in that book, every week when you show up, write your questions down. And in my sessions, I'm going to give you 30 minutes, and I'm going to give rapid fire on questions, answers, questions, answers. And if I need to stay with something longer or whatever, I will make myself available to have those for this deeper conversations. But I want to challenge us to go deeper. I want us, I want us to be able to not create our own black self-help team. That's not what I have no interest in. I want to create an organization that produces, sustains, and supports entrepreneurs. That's it. All the other shit, all that little get rich quick gimmicky stuff, trust me, I got pimp in my blood. My father was a real pimp too. I got pimp in my blood. If I want to pimp an industry, I can I can go there. But that's but I signed up to help my people. And that's what allows me to continue to go, how can we get better every day? Because that's the deepest of the commitment. So with that being said, Court, fire this shit up, bro. Man, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Oh, cool. You got a question? Uh, Morgan Housel. Yes, that's him. Morgan Housel. Morgan Housel um, is called um, The Psychology of Money. I promise you. I don't understand why we even talk about this, but this is one of the, one of the I, I, it, it's, it's heat. And like I said, audio, buy the audio book. Buy the audio book. Because I'm going to have you guys reading other materials for next month. When you're doing an audio book, here's a couple of tricks. So when I ride around my car and I'm driving some distance, I got audio books on. What do I need to play music for? If I don't need music is when I don't want to do something. 
Like if you have me, if you if somebody tell me to paint your house, I'm about to play P Funk because I don't want to paint your fucking house, right? Um, but try different times. Maybe when you're washing dishes or when you clean up the house, put on an audio book. If you're going to exercise and you're walking, now if you're weightlifting, audio books is kind of hard. You can do it, but if that weight gets heavy, you don't hear shit besides help. So, 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 just give it, just give it 100. So, um, I, I fixed that. So, um, uh, but try the audio book. And what you'll find is that many of us are busy. I get it. But you got to make an investment in yourself. And you got to find creative ways to invest in self. And you got to stop waiting for Lady Chance, Hope, and the rest of your imagination, imaginary uh, friends to come save you. Right? Because at the end of the day, everybody that can hear my voice can produce. Everybody that can hear my voice can have the life they want. But you got to know what the fuck that is. And so if you're not making that investment, then you're trusting old ideas to get you to a new place. If you want to go somewhere new, you got to think different. You can't keep repeating the same. It's like we doubling down on badass ideas, and then we start buying into like, man, I just some shit just don't work for me. No, you just got bad ideas. Change your ideas. Everybody in this room is smart, unless you I mean unless you got some chemical in your mind right now, you can't hear me. But everybody else in this room is smart. And so, but you got to put that time in. There's just no way around it. Let me sit that up quick. I'll be right back. Of course, fired up. What's it? Undercurrent, undercurrent, that's the theme of the day, undercurrent. You guys know what an undercurrent is? Anybody? Can somebody answer that? Undercurrent. Go ahead, answer. let's speak on the mic. No, 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 a real, a real undercurrent, not the metaphor, but a real undercurrent. Undercurrent. Okay. Uh, the undercurrent is like something that happens in the ocean, like where they have like rip tides and stuff, and it's the pressure that happens below <coughs> the surface of the water. Okay. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, an uh, undercurrent is what happens below the surface of the water. It's a current. It's a system. It's a rhythm. It's a pattern. It's a path. It goes, and the surface is doing whatever it's doing, whether that's um, crashing, crashing waves being still, whatever, there's an undercurrent. So the class, th these these past six months, um, let's, okay, wait, wait, yeah, the class, the class these past six months, the whole reason why we, we split this in half is, is to first break down on the emotional side because it's no fucking way you can grow, expand, build, entrepreneur, Multiply, magnify your business if you haven't multiplied, magnified yourself. Not possible. So if you haven't become a better you, then you can't become a better business person. It's impossible. And that's what a lot of where a lot of um, instructions, classes and shit have failed is because they'll throw out all kind of business game to you. But if you don't love yourself, you can't process it. Or if you catch it and try it, you self-sabotage it. You'll cannibalize yourself because you haven't worked on the in, inward, the inside. And so that's why we split this up. So this first six months was to really work on the emotional side of you. The, the you in you. If you say, I am an entrepreneur, this is working on the I am part of you so that we can get that strong so, you're, so the entrepreneurship side can be strong. So I want to review the last six months quickly. Um, but think of that word undercurrent. Think of the word undercurrent, and I'll tell you why. So at the very beginning, we talked about the Code of Extraordinary Mind book. So that's the last time we're going to be going through this book. But there's some good nuggets in there. One is talking about the culture scape. You remember that? We talked about the culture scape. Basically, a fish is the last person to know that it's in water. And as an entrepreneur-minded person, you have to know that you're in a fish tank. You're in a culture scape. The system that you're working through, the, you know, the, the language you speak, the schools you went to, the churches you went to, the clothes you put on, the music you lent, went to, the hood you grew up in, the choices you make, the women or men you find attractive, all that shit comes from a culture scape that trained you. 
and embedded that into your What'd you say? No, what was the word? Embedded that into your... Mental? What's, what was the definition you gave? Oh, undercurrent. Undercurrent. So once it embeds into your undercurrent, you forget it's there. And you think you're making decisions. You think you're making choices. You think you got control. Fucking got no control. You just... Whatever saying, so have you? Who has kids here? Have you ever one day said some shit to your kids and you were like, "Wait a minute, my mom used to say that to me." What the, what the, f and I hate it when she said that, because they embedded that into your undercurrent and it didn't come out until you needed it. But you are in a culture scape, and understand you are not in control. This. As a human, if we took a magnifying glass or, or a microscope and went down to your cells that make you up, you're 99% space. The cell is empty, 99%. It has a nucleus and an atom rotating around, has a positive charge. That's it. Most of you, most of you are made up, you can't see. Most of what you are made up of, you can't even see it. So Understand we're living this culture scape and in order to entrepreneur, in order to, to, to build something greater than what you have, then you have to think outside of your box. You don't owe Oakland nothing. You don't owe your hood nothing. You don't owe where you grew up. You don't, mm -mm. Your parents, your religion, you, you have the right to challenge and divorce all that shit if it's not serving you. Um. The second thing, one of the things we learned is, again, this culture scape is made up. It's not real. It's made up. Humans, men just decided they wanted to do X, and then they're like, there's X. So they're right. They, were, they had the power. But all of it is, is challengeable. Remember that. Now, there was other things in that book, but let's skip to the next book. Ego is the enemy. Ego is the enemy is a book that I hope broke you down a little bit. At minimum, chipped away at your ego a little bit. Key things in ego as an enemy to wrap a lot of that shit up is be a servant. Be of service. Every time you show up to a place, be, a, be of service. Be a servant. Palms up. How can I serve you? Fuck that. I'm a boss shit. I'm a boss. I'm a boss. I'm a boss. Um, I'm an entrepreneur because I don't want nobody telling me what to do. All that is fake. Be of service. How can I serve you? That's basically ego and ego is the enemy in a nutshell. If you want to be in a love relationship, evaluate how, how of how much value do you have to bring to one? Meaning how much could you serve a significant other? And it ain't about money. Well, I got a good job. That ain't shit. It's how much how much service could you be to that person? If you want to be an entrepreneur, how much service could you be to customers? If you want to be a leader, how much service you can be to the people you want to lead? That's all anytime anything that's done big is. And remember, these things that we speak on have been simplified. So so you can't get caught up in in the East Oakland hood vernacular that they're spoken in is because we've taken these complicated ideas and broke them down to where we can understand them because that's how our brain worked. And that's the value we give to you is saying, no, no, this is how this is really, here's the nuts and bolts of it. This is how it is in our language. So end of the day is how much how, of how much service can you be to anything you show up to? You want to be the king the king is the ultimate servant to his people. You want to be the queen? The queen is the ultimate servant to her people. So move with the servant's mentality. Second thing in ego is me. Shut the fuck up. That's the book, basically what the book is saying. Shut the fuck up. The brain uses the same amount of resources in doing as it is in saying so 
any time, all of everybody know all the people who's doing big things. I'm doing big things, man. What you been up to, man? I'm doing big things. I got this. I got that. 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 Your brain doesn't know the difference. It doesn't know if you're lying or not. It thinks you're doing big things. So then it's like, oh well, we ain't got to do shit. Then turn on the TV. Wait, wait, I, you, I'm, I gotta work. No, but you said you was doing big things. What's, what's, what's... So you confuse your brain when you talk. Don't say shit. Just do. Just do the work. Um. We say, or he says, and I, I, you, I, I adopted it too. Your bank account is your your report card. Your bank account is your report card. That's like, like, I think that would shut a lot of motherfuckers up. Because I've been bad boozled by it in the gym. People sometimes think to to equalize with me or to minimize me, they gotta tell me all the big shit they doing. And some of it, man, I've been around this place for forty something years, and sometimes I still get caught up. Like, what? That's dope. That's crazy. That's good because I love to see black people doing good. Yeah, come through. Let's talk. And then we talk, and this motherfucker ain't doing nothing. He just talking. So sh make that part of your undercurrent. Less talking, more doing. Um, also, understand the power of the mind. Our minds are way more powerful than we, we give them credit for or than we use them to be. There's something cl called the placebo effect. Then there's inspiration and there's motivation. Now, we don't preach and speak about these things a lot, but still use them to your advantage. When you believe in something, when you're inspired by something, when you're motivated by something, it gives you and some extra gears. What we're saying is you got to be you got to be we got to know how to drive and you got to be on the right road and you have to have the skills to maneuver the car you're driving. It's not just motivation and inspiration alone, but you need it. Just like he said, if he's doing some shit that he don't like, he's going to listen to music because music is going to give him a little more than listening to a podcast by doing some shit he don't like because it changes the motivation and inspiration. So use those things. Um, another thing, self-love. Got to love yourself. You got to work on loving yourself and raising your self value. The key, the, remember the key elements, self-acceptance, self-forgiveness, and self-love. Those are the three elements that you got to work on constantly. Put it in your undercurrent. That's a huge one, by the way. Self-love is the number one reason for the inability to save money. Mm-hmm. If you don't love yourself, you're always unconsciously spending money to 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 project to other people that you're value valuable. Mm. Because it, you don't need that much. What you need to be happy is actually not that much. Your budget will come down tremendously. Most of us spend money to send on other to send them to other people that were valuable because we're not valuable to ourselves yet. So self love is like this. It's this addiction running wild that as we try to satisfy it. It steals time, attention, and money from us, which are the most valuable assets. Remember, time, attention, money. And and because even in your time, we don't love yourself, you'll find yourself spending too much time, even when you're not doing something, thinking about what you need to do to gain love. So not loving yourself is a huge leak. It's very expensive, very costly. Many people would be millionaires right now if they learn to love themselves. Yep. Second thing is, I mean, uh, uh, another thing. Remember we talked about ain't nobody coming to save you? Ain't nobody coming. Don't bank on them reparations. Don't, ain't nobody coming to save you. 40 acres and mules. Ain't 40 acres and none of that shit. So life ain't fair. Who said, who told you life was supposed to be fair in the first place? When you focus on solutions, then you're able to, Take control of your own emotions and go after what you want. Period. I was talking to, to was it Tanil on the on the plane? Tanil hella, Tanil hella fun by the way. She is. Cool people, cool people. Enjoy. Um, somebody asked me, 
and um, when I was going through my own revolution, spiritual revolution, there was time that I spent, oh, oh no, it's Cassandra. I spent a year as an atheist because I was so confused and I've been in church my whole life. I was like, man, fuck this shit. I, uh uh-uh. Too hard. And I grew up in a hood, super struggling, rats and roaches, and my mom was super religious, so I'm just going to call it a, a, a non-thing. Now, I, I, I worked myself out of that eventually, but you know what was good about that year? I, I adopted the mentality, ain't nobody coming. Nobody saving me. It's all on me. And I worked my ass, I busted my ass off. I, my psychology completely changed. I started going after it. I stopped making excuses. I stopped looking up to the sky, to around me, to other people. Pr- I stopped praying and I stopped doing none of that. And I just, it, I knew everything had to happen. I was going to make it happen. Now, of course, I, I, I changed, those, I, I, I adopted those beliefs later, adapted those beliefs later, but that gave me a lot. So now I still work like ain't nobody coming. I pray too, but I work like ain't nobody coming. I strategize like ain't nobody coming. I prioritize. I look at contingencies like ain't nobody coming. If a catastrophe happens and it's it's raining hellfire, I'm sitting thinking, okay, so the next time that happens, how can we mitigate that? What's the strategy? What what did we do wrong? How can can we learn from that? Some people would be like, now, Court, you know you couldn't do nothing about Hellfire. It's just how it is. You just, nobody knows about him. Not an entrepreneur. Not an entrepreneur. So if you adopt that mentality, you put that mentality in your undercurrent, you'll think differently. We, we talked about popular versus effective. He touched on that earlier. Popular versus effective. If you, if you get caught up in what's popular and not what's effective, then you're going to get swept away like everybody else with every diet, with every money hustle, with every situation, with all kind of shit that the wind blows and people follow. That's so powerful. Most of us think we're rational because we adopt popular beliefs or we align it with popular ideas. Many of us, when we hit a crossroad, We don't pick up a book and do research or we don't use our tools to figure it out. We lean towards the popular idea. Like if if that alone, popular ideas are plagued with so many diseases of thought, so many self-destructive ideas that sound so good. It's almost like, you know how you have imaginary white men in the hood that's listening to your conversations so you lower your voice when you say white people? Um, We heard that all this week. there's an imaginary pimp at the crossroad, uh, and he's called uh, the leader of popular ideas. And the way he's pimping you, by having you v- embrace all the popular ideas. Most of the popular ideas, there's more f- pseudoscience and horrible strategies and popular ideas and popular trends than you can even begin. That's why, so that idea he just dropped on you, I, got, I want you guys to like start to look for that idea, because if you haven't been seeking that, you don't see what he just said. But popular ideas is, because human beings don't, the way we work as humans is part of our nature. We don't really have time to think about everything. It's just be too overwhelming. So, but we don't realize we become addicted to popular ideas. And it's okay to, to embrace a popular idea until it's time to get to work. You gotta be able to stop and say, it's time to get to work. Do I really own this idea or did I just embrace a popular idea? And so, I, and I'm talking about popular ideas, not just ne- not necessarily like pop culture or majority of America. It can also be popular ideas within your small group, in your in, your, in the hospital, as a scientist, in a college, um, in a church. Popular ideas is not thinking for yourself. Yeah. So, ask yourself the questions: Where did that come from? Something can sound good. Even from here, where'd that come from? Where'd you get it from? Where'd you learn it from? Has it been tested? Have you tried it? Who tried it? If you don't ask those questions and you just go off the, the, the sexiness of the sound, then that's how you caught up. Challenge the shit. Challenge everything. Put that in your undercurrent to challenge everything. Have you ever been 
around that person that's irritate you just he that person he or she irritates you because everything you say they question it skeptics be that person be that person be that person is you because if you're not that person either internally or externally then you're going to get programmed and hypnotized by whatever's popular Remember stress plus stress plus nutrients equals growth. Remember that? Hmm. Stress plus nutrients equals growth. R remember that. Why not nutrients alone? Because you'll become impotent with no power. Remember the the example about the butterfly, you see a you see a a, a caterpillar going into a cocoon, you see it struggling and fighting, and if you feel sorry for it and try to help it and cut it out, it will never fly because you took away the stress. You took away the stress. So as humans, for us to thrive, improve, grow, we need stress. We need to feel scarcity. We need to feel some, oh, shit, what am I going to do? We need to feel some, oh, I got to get this done. Or, oh, man, I'm fucked up. I, you need to feel some of that. If not, if you if you you grow if you get all nutrients in your life, then you grow impotent. How many rich kids, how many rich people's kids ain't shit? Because it's because if you're not savvy enough as a f parent, and if you become highly successful, m upper class, and you don't know this formula, which a lot of times people don't know, you want to give your kids everything you didn't have. So you, it's all nutrients, no stress. They grow up, ain't shit. And you don't understand why, because they had the best environment. They had the best teachers, the best schools, the best maids, the best food, the best everything. How come they ain't shit? Because there was no stress. I have a question. Can I ask a question? Uh, let, me, let me hold it. I'm almost done. Remember, compound interest in everything. Everything is compound interest. Everything. How you got here is compound interest. Everything is compound interest. How you see the world is compound interest. Your money, compound interest. Your business, compound interest. People say, I want to blow up. I want to blow up. I want hella customers. I want to go viral on Instagram. Look, get one customer and be so good at, at servicing that one customer that, he, that she tells somebody. Now you got two. You just doubled up. Now do the same thing with that two, and now you got four. That's all you focus on is servicing the hell out of what's in front of you. And that's how compound interest um, magnifies. You know, do you know which dimension that we see life on? We see life in the third dimension. So there's there's... There's multiple dimensions right now. Zero dimensions is just a dot. One dimension is a straight line. So if there is organisms in life, it has to live in that straight line. Two, the second dimension is like a reading a newspaper cartoon where you see cartoons drawn up on a newspaper. It's flat. Third dimension comes into play where you have depth. That's the only difference between the other dimensions. Fourth dimension, the fourth dimension now, I, if you've ever studied physics or quantum physics or anything, and you've seen what, what um, a, a square looks like in fourth dimension, your eyes, it's hard for you to even wrap your head around what it looks like because that's not how we have adapted and evolved to be, to be. So life is happening in certain, in, and there's, Infinite more, 70, 80, 90 dimensions. We live in, we just live here. Real quick, become obsessed with compounding. Don't just list the compounding as, <clears throat> compounding is a superpower. It's a magic trick. It's almost, it's going to, It's you can't wrap your brain around compounding as you hear me speak about it. It's something you're only going to understand through the experience but you, your brain literally can't rationalize it. It's hard for your brain. If you just look at a compounding exercise, your brain can't wrap itself around it. It doesn't make any sense to you. That with that one, one by time you move it, by time you compound it 64 times, 
it went from one to quadrillion. Like, I don't think you understand. Like, you, you, you really can't see compounding, but it's one of the most super most powerful. We're we going to teach you some other principles, but other principles are going to teach you compounding is one of the top principles. And I promise you, you don't hear compounding language in the black community at all. It doesn't exist. You don't hear compounding amongst poor people. It doesn't exist. But when you talk about people who move and shake and have impact, they rely, compounding is the ultimate walk of faith. You can't see where you're going, but all the, all the signs that you know you're going the right way. And compounding is one of those things where you can change your habits and think, oh, that's not that big, and disrupt the compounding and literally lose massive steps because you don't understand the importance of the consistency to maintain for compounding the work. There's a recipe for compounding the work. And if you just change that recipe slightly, you can lose such a huge, huge impact. So become, I mean, when you leave this class tonight, I want you guys, every time you hear the word compounding, become curious, investigate, and learn as much as you can because it's going to come up a lot in the next few months. But it has not only your money, it has to do with everything. Matter of fact, life is rarely ever a straight line. Life has more compounding in it than straight lines in the universe. So like, oh, there's a straight line in the universe? They don't know. It's a compounding effect. Your mind wraps it up as a, a straight line, but there's very few straight lines in the universe. So there's, there's, there's all kinds of principles around lines, but compounding is one of the major principles. And I can't begin to tell you, like, it's a thing that I still go, that shit crazy. To this day, I still think compounding is the most craziest shit I've ever seen in my life. And if once you get a grasp of it and you start to adopt it in your psyche, it's like somebody actually put a pair of glasses on you and you can see stuff that other people can't see. It's a math of the universe that is so fucking powerful, it's going to fuck you up. But you can't feel it. That's what's so crazy about it. Your rationalization just doesn't feel it. Yeah. So... And then we'll get to questions. So, so then after that, we moved on to emotional agility, which we're going to wrap up tonight. But what I want to say to you is this. Moving on to this next six months, it's going to be a, a, a whole nother level that Nana is going to speak on that I can't even speak on in some ways. I can't. And it's strategy. It's data. It's strategy. It's ways of thinking. But if you don't have all these tools that we talked about in your undercurrent, then you're going to reject it anyway internally. So you got to be continuing to work on the, these things through this next six months. You still got to be working on these things and, and learning and improving and growing the emotional side of yourself in your, un, in your undercurrent the, this whole time so that, it, so that what you do learn in the next six months takes hold. So you grasp it. So it changes the color, the filter of what you're saying. Like I said, have, have, um, I had somebody tell me the other day, um, I was talking to them about, um, about ego. E ego is an enemy. And they said, and she told me, she's like, Court, I remember you saying this last, maybe about a year ago, you, you said the same thing. And I was like, yep, okay, yep, that's good. But now that I'm going through what I'm going through, it hits so much different. Like now I hear, now I hear you for real. So the point is, if you're not working on this stuff, some of the things is going to be like, oh, that was dope. Oh, that sounded good. Oh, that was, that's interesting. Oh, that was cool. And some of y'all is going to hit you because you've been doing the work. You're working on yourself. You're open. You're, you're, you're chipping away more at your ego. So now there's a wedge and a crack that the knowledge can seep through now. And now it's seeping through to your undercurrent. Do you honestly think we can recut? We, we, all the books we read, we, it just snaps off at the top of our head at all times? Hell no. But guess what happens when you adopt it and you live it? It starts living in your undercurrent. And when you need it, boom, it pops out. Here, here it is. Because I've been doing, you, I've been working. We've been doing this shit um, in the undercurrent this whole time. So we strong down here. You just can't see it because that's what doing the work does. If it doesn't seep down, it's like a rock, a solid rock with water just running off it. So the, continue to do this work. Understand where you are in the culture scape. Work on your ego. 
Be a servant. Be a servant. <coughs> and understand that emotional agility is the only way you can maneuver around as an entrepreneur and not just an entrepreneur, as a human being, how you show up to your relationships, how, how you show up to your kids. One of the things we talked about with uh, emotional uh, uh, ego as an enemy, too, is respect, right? Respect culture. You got to respect me. We don't give a fuck about that. There's certain levels that you got to show up to respect as man, yes. But the amount of energy we give to respect, man, that shit is old bullshit. That whole book, General Principle, you should have did that on GP. <laughs> we throwing that out the, no, GP don't exist. That's fake. That's fake. Now, now any questions? Before you ask a question, let me say this real quick. Almost everything we're going to learn in the next six months is taking the ingredients that he's giving you and just create different recipes. But like, if you don't understand those ingredients, and I say, pass me, Pass me um, a certain season that is not commonly known, you start to get lost in the process. And now by the time I get to the end of the meal, you're like, I don't even know how you made that, bro. Mm -hmm. I'm lost. Mm -hmm. Like, and here's the thing. Those basics is like martial arts. You know how you join martial arts, you never stop being a white belt. You're just advancing the white belt. Mm -hmm. That's the foundation. He taught a white belt course that's going to prime you to be all the other colors. But you gotta have this, and we still train those. Everything he's taught, the reason I get excited, because I'm always working on myself. Like I don't get to go, well, I got that now. I'm I'm past that. I'm here now, right? It's like once I stop practicing, just like we weightlifting. <laughs> once you stop li lifting weights, everybody can tell you what happens to that body. It doesn't say, well, you know, you used to lift weights in high school, so you 40 years of age, you should be cool. Sure. Everybody be like, fuck, fuck, fuck your 18-year-old life. We live in this real 40-year-old life right now. And that's the same thing how poverty works. Once you start training for growth, you start to unconsciously sink. It's an invisible process. It won't be like, like you fell off the, off the side of a cliff. It's like the ground is sinking underneath you, and then before you know it, it just one day comes down really hard on you. And so <clears throat> he's giving you so many, like you don't, once you get to the next level, you don't get to skip these principles he gave you. You don't get to say, I like this one, but I'm going to leave that one behind, but I'm going to take this one. No. That was hard. You got to take all that shit mm. with you, the good and the bad and the ugly. And you got to embrace that shit. And as you embrace that shit, because when it comes time to apply this really complex idea, which ain't that complex if you have these ideas, it's just taking the, it's taking the ingredients he gave you to create this new recipe. Right, which might require some timing, understand why this will go with that, and why the timing works with this better than this, and how it has these external factors to make it come into fruition. But if you actually skip this process of working on self, like if you just been coming to this class, treat it the way some of you guys treat church, because you know some of y'all don't even read the Bible. Y'all just be showing up the preachers the Bible. And some of y'all treat this us like we're the we're the uh, we're reading the we're the text that you should be reading for yourself or um, or we're gonna work out for you. Like you got you got this buff ass trainer, and you think you buff. No, your trainer's buff. You fat. And so the reality is that because you this 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 honesty that you're having with yourself, when it comes time to run this marathon, you can't get past the first block. You you got asthma spray out and all kind of shit happening, right? Because you skipped the process. And so the six months that we broke it up. I can't begin, and, and for those who alumni, some of you guys have been doing this for three or four years, so y'all ain't got no excuses. But for the new students, um, if you join the class like recently, go back and start watching some of those old classes. Court was dropping so much game. There was some that I I I I started acting like he was a preacher, and I got sanctified, like just cheering me on because I was so excited about the shit, the way he structured it, and the way he put the words together. Even though you got, you got somehow you got to remember what you said to that dude. I said that shit was so tight. Like I really like. He said something to somebody this weekend. I was like, dude, don't forget that shit. It was so tight. Um, but um, the, the, the basics will never go away. And the basics are going to change as you grow. Like how you show up when you got $1,000 in the bank is going to be totally different than how you're going to show up when you got a million in the bank. How you show up when you got $10 million in the bank or let's say $10 million, you're cool. Okay, that's my stopping point. I'm good at $10 million. But now if you're a builder, that doesn't mean you stop building. So now when you start building a nonprofit, it's going to change the game. 
When you start working with kids, it's going to change. When you start working with adults, it's gonna, all this going to change the game. You get married, it's going to change the game. You have some kids, it's going to change the game. If you ain't constantly working on yourself, you're creating this false perception that you have arrived. It's a continuum. So mm -hmm. the shit he just dropped, <clears throat> it's so much fire in that. Like those are not lightweight principles, and hopefully maybe we can send those out to everybody um, to, uh, to Neo so they can kind of reference those things the first six months of what you need to go back in. And, and I promise you, when you guys say, man, this is not transferring, watch me reference a lot of stuff he taught. Yeah. So, so again, remember, put, put these principles in your undercurrent. Practice them. So how, how they get into your undercurrent is through practice. Practice. It's the only if if you don't practice them then they'll be on the surface and so it'll look like you cry waves and the waves are high and everybody's like oh look at that look at that wave look at the wave look at the water it's beautiful nothing in your undercurrent come on so embed this in your undercurrent through practicing these systems and yes stay simple it's not a, a complicated equation that or I'm, I sound super educated. No, it's, these principles are simple. They're simple. They're dumb simple. It, what, what people what people fail to do a lot of times is just put them into practice, or they think they're too intelligent to practice them. Oh, that's too. That, that's that's easy shit. Teach me the complicated shit. Yeah, there you go, Corey. You know, this weekend, real quick, we 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 went um we went to Oklahoma. Um, almost everybody who sat down with me either cried or gave this really humbling testimony of their weaknesses. And how did that happen? Um, I didn't run up on nobody and flex on anybody, but I cut through the pride bullshit. Going back to, because our people don't feel like we're good enough, we learn to become great salesmen of who we want to be as if we're that person today. So when we show up, we sell to you our thoughts as if we have mastered them and we're controlling them and we're driving them. But when I get to, but if I get to your house, you're at home watching cartoons. But the way you sound as if I'm gonna walk in your house and it's gonna like an MIT convention. And so what happened was I was pissed off about being in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was really pissed off because all the food was bad and the worst coffee I ever had. And anybody knows I like my coffee. All the coffee tastes like piss. Everybody, and even the fancy places, was like, you want this fancy piss? No, I was done. And so people would come over to our table and they'd be rah rah, and I'm doing, ah, I'm doing this, I'm amazing, I got big goals, I'm got, yeah, I'm got big things happening. And of course, caught me on the wrong weekend. So tell me more. So when you say tell me more, you ain't ready for that script. You used to be like, what? You doing that? Man, you tight. Oakland is full of this shit. I promise you on everything. Oakland is full of this shit. That's people right now making money on the rah-rah. So then it came down to, let me hear your numbers. And when they would say them numbers, I'd be like, man, what the fuck you doing? What do you mean what the fuck I'm doing? Why are you wasting your time making that little punk-ass money right there? That's no money. You can't spend no many hours for that kind of money. Motherfuckers at McDonald's, I was whooping your ass. Or I would tell somebody like, this woman, this woman was like, you know, it's because your masculinity is so strong. I said, oh. Tell me about your relationship with men. By the time I got through it, my husband left me for a white woman and I ain't never been the same. <laughs> <laughs> That's that ego shit he's talking about. The ego got all the people I'm speaking to. I'm not telling you this because I'm being messy. It's common. And what, what am I suggesting? Going back to ego's the enemy. Many of us are living a life to satisfy our ego as opposed to living a life to satisfy, satisfy ourselves. If we align ourselves, look, weakness is a part of the game. If you hear, right, and let's say you roll, okay, let's say you start off, you dead zero broke. You got to the point now, you got more money than most of your partners. Once you decide you want to go to that next mountaintop, you're at the bottom again. You're at the bottom. And every time you decide to get to, you want to get to the top of that mountain, you decide you want to go to the next mountaintop, you're at the bottom. There's a humility in this process that we're in. We don't gain a lot from falsifying where we are in our journey. Because what I just did is I removed the value of our, of our conversation to how you can give me some experience that may help me along the way. It might just be encouragement like, hey, hang in there. 
I really believe in you. That might that's my all I need. But if I tell you I'm already at the top of all my mountains, that's all I've always been on the top of a mountain, and I know nothing else besides high altitude. <laughs> then no one can save your broke ass. No one can save, no one can pull you out of your depression. No one can tap you on the shoulder and say it's gonna be all right because you don't lie to everybody and frame the stuff so wrong. And in Oakland, you go out in Oakland, go to a festival, and everybody's selling you pride cake. I'm on top. I'm doing. Look at me. I'm I, 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 because everybody's hustling. Everybody's um, running promotions. We don't. We we've, we've become drunken with charisma. You let a motherfucker walk in here that ain't talking about shit, and you'll fall in love with. Him. Who's that motherfucker? I tell you, I can't stand his ass. Um, from Harvard, I said I can't stand his ass for shit. Huh? Cornell West. Thank you. Cornell West goes on television to speak to who? Harvard, Harvard professors are the public. So if he's speaking to the public, his greatest value would be to deliver language and words that will have public impact, right? Then why the fuck he talk to the professors while he's in public? You ever heard him speak before? He uses words I'm sure you've never heard of a day of your fucking life. He's in his head with his Frederick Douglass suits on. Right? When you disconnect from reality to the point that you buy into these ideas of who you think you are, what you want to be, that's your ego getting out of control. It's so out of control. Now you're spending money to protect. Now you're driving this expensive-ass car you barely can pay for so you can protect the ego image that you created. Now you're going after the, the mate that will complement the ego image you created. Now some of you are living in the closet from a life you really want to live because the ego you created. You don't know how to build a relationship with reality because your ego has kept you from it. That's why this shit he's telling you is like, I'll give you these next group of strategies. It's like, it's like if you took a, um, a couch person who wants to be a basketball, who wants to be a basketball player but never practices, just brought a right, right, nice basketball, uh, basketball, wears nice clothes when he watches the game. If I gave him the Warriors strategy, it has no value to him. What are you going to do with it? He can't play. He can't defend. He don't have enough oxygen. What are you going to do? You don't have no skills. You don't even practice. You can't shoot. You can't even do a layup. So I can give you all the, I can give you all the X's. So here's, here's the booklet of all the Warriors strategy. Here you go. Secret, this is a secret booklet. You can't do shit with it. You not you not you never did the preparation, and that's what you've been learning the first six months is how to prepare yourself to work with the strategy that's going to be delivered to you. Otherwise, you will ineffectively compromise the strategy with the way you think. Being an entrepreneur is not adding more information to the knowledge you already have. You know the Bible calls it being born again, and in entrepreneurs we call it changing your state of mind. Those of you who are refusing to let go of the current state because it's your comfort zone is stuck between your institutionalization and your freedom. You got to make a decision which one you want, but you can't play both sides. They don't go together. They just don't. <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah. So before we move on, any questions about this last six months? You want to start off, Shakina? She got the mic already. Um, so this is going back to when you were talking about, um, I'm sorry, I have a lot of notes, um, critical thinking. So my question was, should this be an internal or an external thing? Um, and how do you not block your blessings and not damage your social currency while being a skeptic? Wait, so, so, uh, did you get the question? I didn't get the question. Yeah. Because so, so, I think you, I think context is lost because you're taking notes. Yeah. So can sorry. you explain it? Put it in your word, own words. I was, I was trying to capture it before the thought fleeted away. Um. So when you were talking about, you know that motherfucker that you can't stand and always questioning everything you say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like be that person, be skeptical about everything. So in my head, my filter processed that as like being a critical thinker, like asking questions mm -hmm. about everything. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if I interpreted that correctly, mm -hmm. but what my question is. And becoming a, a skeptic person, like being that skeptic or becoming a critical thinker, is that something that should be an external thing where you're showing people that you're processing 
the information and feedback that they're giving them? Or should that be an internal dialogue that you're having so that you don't damage your social, social currency? Because nobody likes an asshole either. And people like to be listened to. So how do you find that balance between like being um, thoughtful about what you're taking in and absorbing and applying, but also like not just following all the social cues that we're just so naturally going to do as herd animals. All right. So y'all know I'm not a fan of the word balance, right? It's harmony. It's both. So it's, it's within, it's within the context. It's, it's, um, it's you also knowing when to, to do which one. Remember he talks about time, attention, money, right? So, how much time do you want to spend arguing, battling every single situation? How much time do you want to spend? Add that up every day. If you were to challenge uh, externally every single person that's stuck in a culture scape, like it's not our job to save every motherfucker. It's our job to save ourselves. So as long as you are, you know, as long as you are questioning the things around you and be like, well, why? Where'd that come from? Can you explain me? What are the results? And if you move like that internally, there's going to be times where somebody's going to come to you and want to challenge you or ask you a question or present something to you or sell you something. Man, by all means. But how much time do you want to spend all day, every day challenging everything? Think you, you like you, you can use your own discernment in those ways. I don't. Man, I be sometimes in situations people think I'm the dumbest hood dude on the earth. Damn, for real? Damn, that's crazy. I can break that shit down four different ways if I wanted to. But do I feel like it? Do I want to? Is it time? No, because I'm brainstorming a new idea. I'm trying to think, man, how can I grow my business? Or how can I solve this one problem in my business? How much time is gonna, am, I, am I going to spend on this particular shit? And is this motherfucker? No. I, yep, that was dope. That was dope. Anyways, back to my thought. Now, there, there are situations where you want to open dialogue. I love when me and when Nana have time to where we can sit and challenge each other and go back and forth from ideas and break things down. And like, if not, then you you can't form a better idea or you can't go home and and put things in your undercurrent. So it's it's a both. It's not an either or. Huh? Trust but verify. That's how I look. I look. Explain, explain, so explain it to me. Explain so, um, and I'm just gonna. By the way, I love like your my voice. Background. By the way, I love your voice. Oh. If you if you well, if you ever run out of no. money, go, into, go go on radio. You'll go crazy. They love you. Hey, and Tanil told me about. Her I've been told I have a face for radio, but um, yeah. <laughs> your voice is great. Just kidding. <laughs> so when I was in the Navy, okay, um, uh, we work a lot with regulations, um, laws, and whatnot. So people want to submit requests, and sometimes like, well, um you know, I'm not going to just take you at face value all the time, right? But there's some people you're like, okay, all right, okay, here, I'll get it. But there's an instruction for that. So wh what's your, where's the instruction for that? What's your backup? That's like, you know, where is it in the book? And I, I get what you're saying, where you're saying you don't want to always be like, mm, I don't believe you, you know? And you don't always want to challenge somebody all the time because you don't want to be the asshole. But you could be like, all right, cool. And then, when you, you know, you could go back and you could look all that stuff up and verify it. So you're not always being confrontational with somebody and people think you a liar. You, you, them, when they think that you don't trust them, right? But you just kind of, oh, okay, cool. That sounds good. <laughs> I mean, because I do it a lot. I, I, and my story is, a, is something I'm not going to get into, but I mean, people come up to me with, with stuff, and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm on board. Here, let me get your name. Give me a business card. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. All right, yeah, let's get into that. And then I go, oh, I'm just do this stuff. You see this shit? It's like, no. But I, but I'm not gonna tell them, man. You, I'm not gonna tell them, man. Let me, let me look over your stuff right now. But you know, the, trust but verify. Y yeah, there's some there's there's a degree of truth to that too. I mean, there's, I I I I'll, yeah. I'm not. I'm gonna add to some. I want to add to that. I don't want I don't want to challenge that. I want to add to that. Mm -hmm. This is an argument. This is actually a strong question that scientists deal with all the time. Scientists are, are trained skeptics. Right, so as trained skeptics, they have to always go out, but they realize that that's also a slippery slope in this sl slope in itself, which is that's where you was going with, you know, the social side of that. Um, 
one of the things that there's an argument of also don't always be rational, try to be reasonable, right? Um, sometimes people need flawed thoughts to move forward. Like there's certain religious ideas that we can all pick apart. And I'm sure there's religious ideas today that people can pick apart, but it kept some people sane, right? So sometimes right ain't right, right? It's, 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 it's when is, when is it effective is more important, right? So if somebody believes, needs to believe that there's a fairy that's going to reward them if they take care of their kids, they graduate from high school, leave the fairy alone. Right? Maybe that's just, if they perform at a high level, now if the fairy says some weird shit, now I might have to challenge you on the fairy. But usually I, I try to disrupt only when somebody says, I am struggling with something, I can't figure this out. But if you, if you come to me and you, your bravado's high, I'm doing, I'm killing it, and everything I believe in is real, yeah, 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 I do it all the time. Because at the end of the day, human beings are these, Humans are so complex. That's why I don't like this whole broad sweeping idea of they, them, people of color. What the fuck does that mean? But anyway, um, human beings are so goddamn complex that sometimes we're holding together, holding ourselves together with tape. And we start removing the tape. I'm not sure if we're willing to deal with the other side of that. And so it's it's really about wisdom. That's what every scholar, every scientist I've ever seen argued around the same, because it's a scientific discussion, actually, argument. And every scientist have always argued that it's not an issue of right versus wrong or when you should or when you not should. It's if you're gonna if you're gonna present that type of image, that is that is an act of wisdom and growth. So when to apply what and how can be straightforward, but when is wisdom. And that's something that you learn through the time and process. Cause I can show you different scenarios when this is right and when this is right, and it can be totally totally opposites, right? As well as in this class. Like starting next month, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is hold two opposites in your eye, to, to hold two opposite ideas that are in total contradiction to both be true. Because you're gonna, I'm gonna run across that. I'm gonna create a lot of that for you. We're gonna have two opposite ideas that are both true, but in the real world there will be argument. But as an entrepreneur, what separates those ideas is win. Mm -hmm. Question in the back. We, we, before I'm sorry before you go so so you, you guys heard ever in the spiritual world that your body's a temple right here the body's a temple so so some people take that literally some people take that figuratively I take it figuratively meaning I'm very careful what I put in my body physically in terms of food what I what I what I subject what I see what I hear what I what I agree upon so Treating your body as a temple also creates, you have to be very careful about what you say, oh, yes, to, or what you accept. So if somebody's projecting point. something That's onto you, they want to project their insecurities or their fears or their, their personal experiences or their lifestyles, of course you have the authority to be like, nah, you can't project that on me. Uh, you can't project that on me. That worked for you that way. I used to do that to my mom all the time. The white people did you that way. They're not going to do me that way. Well, you can't be going around just arguing with these white people like that. You get fired. That's what they did to you. That's not what they're going to do to me. I'll get another job, but you don't, don't project that fear on me. So you are, you're allowed to protect what you, what, you, what you allow into your temple. Now, if it's casual shit or somebody pick your times, like you said, wisdom. That's a great word, wisdom. I got a question going back to what you said earlier, Nana, about um, <clears throat> saving and self-love. Issue isn't so much about saving, but when you're spending in your ego, I don't know, maybe one of you can answer, how do you discern, am I feeding my ego? Or do I really, because I, I have a shoe collection and I know where it stems from. It's from being having K-Swiss my whole life, right? So when I go to the store, to the mall, it's hard not to pass by the shoe store. I'm, I don't think I'm feeding my ego because I don't even wear them. So nobody even sees them. But to me, it's like, I finally got some nice shoes. So how do you discern when you're in those places to just keep walking or, you know? Okay, a couple of th Thank th you. Thank you. That's a good question. Yeah, that's, that, so first of all, okay, let me be very clear. Um, first thing first is most mental distortions happen unconscious, they're not conscious. So you're not having, 
the unconscious of mental distortions, right? Two, if you ever sat down and said, what do you actually need to be happy? A lot of times we infuse it with trauma or acceptance. Yours may have some trauma tied to it. They, they, what's the name, right? But you don't realize that until you resolve that, which still kind of, still is tied to not feel like you're good enough because the case Swiss, I didn't feel I could have, so now I can't have, I'm going to have, right? As opposed to, um, well, what am I going to wear? What do I even care about? What am, what am I have time and place? Come on, have a seat, bro. Um, what am I, what am I have space for, right? Those kind of conversations are different. Why is that? Because there's a naivety also in most of us when it comes to money. This is in a book, actually, The Psychology of Money. I can't wait to you read it because he gets into like layers of how to identify those those levels of enough, right? The issue of enough is so more so much more powerful than you realize. There's people that spend their whole life that keep chasing to a point because they don't never feel they have enough, and they don't realize that as you're chasing this invisible thing that you're chasing, that you're it, it's built on the basis that tomorrow is definable. If tomorrow is uncontrollable and the ground could drop from underneath you tomorrow, then why are we not why are we not having a relationship with our money like that? But we spend, like, one of the things he says in the book, he feels sorry for somebody who spends, who gets one check a week and then uses that check to, to maintain their lifestyle. Because when there's volatility or when something, when anything happens crazy, then you literally go, you, you fall hard. You don't fall like everybody else, right? When 9-11 hit, remember I said 9-11 means shit to me. No, 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 but um, COVID. And everybody's like, everybody around me was going, ah! COVID, what am I doing? And I was like, shit, I got two years of runway. I mean that if I don't make a dime, I can pay my I can pay my staff for two years. Because I automatically assume I don't control the future. But your brain wants to perceive that. Your brain never says, tomorrow could be the most catastrophe in the world. And if you look back last 20 years, which one of those did you predict? None of them. So you gotta know that next 20 years you don't predict the next set of them, right? So when we're spending, we're not spending to maintain life consistency. So if life does a dip, we just do bumps. But and what makes us ultimately happy is a sense of certainty. So when you true wealth is defined by being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it, not spending. Spending is uh, rich. Wealth and richness is two different things. So if you're really focused on wealth and then you find yourself overspending in a certain area. You usually copy for, compensate for something psychologically that's happening. Now, do you need to be perfect? No. Because I hate when these kind of sex conversations happen and mothers go home and try to, you know, I'm going to go on my Atkins diet and be perfect. No. Don't burn your shoe collection. Yeah, don't burn your or shoe collection. My no. size come holler at me. I'm yeah. buying from here. You yeah. so, so that's not. Hey, did my microphone go out? Did my microphone still? Yeah, it's still on. Okay. So it's not that I'm not suggesting that. And it's not, like you said, it's not to ask you to go home and bring your shoe collection. I'll be ashamed of it. But it should spark you to have a deeper conversation with yourself. Uh, okay, like, let, let me jump in there because it might. Let, let me jump in there. It, it's, again, the ego is not, don't, don't think the ego is bad. We need portions of our ego. The reason why we walk in this earth as black people with our chest out and our head held high, we could, we could thank our ego for that. Because we didn't have shit, we was treated like shit, we were marginalized, all, of, all, all the things, but we still found a way to find reasons to be confident. So some ways the ego is good. Other ways is it can spark you to, to make a new decision. I got fired, well fuck that shit, alright, I'm gonna I'm a do something, I'm gonna go do it big now. Because of a failure or a rejection or this or that. But it's, the, when, when your ego is doing the driving is where it gets dangerous. Same thing with, you, you have, if you enjoy things, you want to spend your money in, 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 on fun shit, if it's tiny portions of what you bring home every month because, man, you're just having fun, or you enjoy it, you like it, or you don't even know why you do it, but it doesn't affect anything you do in life unless it gets dangerous and you decide you want to change it. He got vanity shit in his garage. I got vanity shit. Too, that I just have it's fun 
But the question is, does it affect you? Now, if you decide you want to change it, then you got to make you have to create changes. And we'll talk. We're going to talk about that later on tonight about when you want to change something, why and what to do. But if if you enjoy if you enjoy those shoes, just looking at it and you will go look at your collection, go. <sighs> then then fine. Now, it be, if it becomes dangerous, meaning you spending you spending money you don't need to be spending on it, or it brings you no joy at all, you just don't know why you're doing it. Then that's then that's and that's where I'm at. Like I don't show them. I barely show them to anybody. I look at them. But the main thing is about you guys. To me, and this is my perspective. You guys are permitted, quote unquote, to have the vanity items, to where I don't think mentally. I mean. Physically, I should be permitted to have the vanity items I have, but I know it's a, a problem. And so I'm just trying to figure out how to discipline my mind to not do those things or See, that, do them so much. That's where I was I, going. I don't think. I, so yeah. so where, where I'm going is I'm not concerned about the shoes. No, it's not the shoes. Yeah, I'm not concerned about the shoes. What I'm concerned about is. Self value. No, no, no. It's, it's, the ego makes a portion of us unavailable to ourselves. Mm-hmm. As a part of us that we don't have access to. And the problem with the ego is that it gets clues. It's like that undercurrent. There's parts of your undercurrent. You don't even feel it. Don't sense it. There's no signs of it on the surface, right? And so in your brain, you're thinking, oh, I'm cool, but there's these weird quirks that are showing up that's compromising relationships, businesses. Uh, are you choosing certain choices that you're like, I like this, but I really don't like this shit. You might, you might find yourself complaining about it. I'm not saying that's what it is for you, right? When you start to have these little signs, it's not about the shoes. It's a clue. If you can't tell yourself why, there's a disconnect and there's something running underneath that current that you need to figure mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a clue to me. That's not a um, it's not a judgment to me, right? Mm-hmm. Two, even I have those conversations because like, so we had when I had my first surge of growth, I bought a lot of shit, and when I bought a lot of shit. It became too much shit. Like it really got to the point. Where it was like, okay, this is a lot of shit. Like you know, when you poor, you had your favorite thing or your favorite two things, and you always know they're there. And you're like, yo, don't, don't you, nobody in this house fuck my two. Th- I know y'all been touching my shit, right? And y'all know how it is. But when you got hella shit like that, and you lose it, and you you don't even know you lost it. Then when you realize you lost it, it occupies your mind for two weeks, and you find it, and you realize it's back in the closet. And you're like, this is too much shit, right? Um, like I like jackets and sweatshirts. I got too many sweatshirts. I'm like, I'm ready to start giving shit away and figure out what is my favorite five or ten and call it a day. And fuck, if y'all be like, no, nah, you rock the same sweatshirts. So what the fuck you? I don't give a shit what you think, right? I got an extra motorcycle. And I'm like, I got to sell this shit. This is ridiculous, right? But I also have a conversation with myself like, why? All the time. Because I want to see the weakness might not mean nothing when you hear, but it might mean everything when you hear. And so if I could get a head start on slowly bringing that under uh, my leadership. Leadership means that you're not suppressing it or you're amplifying it, but I'm leading it. Then when I get here, that gives me more power to drive my vehicle at this stage as opposed to I'm in an autonomous vehicle that's like, oh, shit, where are we going, right? I want to say, okay, yeah, this is this is tempting for me or this is the situation. Um, and recognizing that also, too, because there's billionaires right now who are just chasing the next billion to prove themselves to other billionaires. That's what's going on with the dot-com industry right now. Like, there's no reason in the world after a billion dollars, what the fuck are you doing? Like, what the fuck? It ain't nobody, nobody's going to live here, live that fucking long. What the fuck are you going to buy? Like, I, I can tell you for somebody, got a, you, once you get a certain amount of money, you, you can't buy nothing no more. It gets stupid. It's like, like going to the store feels stupid. Like somebody, oh, you see that new Gucci? I'm thinking, dog, that's branding. What the fuck you mean I see red and green? I saw the outside of the tree. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, I'm not going to spend $400 get a plum off a tree. Why would I put a belt on for $400? That made no fucking sense to me, right? But when you don't have, really, it's a desire to be something else that you're trying to spend. Like, most people, like, like it says in the book, he says, when most people say, I want to be rich, it's not, you're not, you don't, you know, you're not really saying it. You don't know what you're saying. You don't want to be wealthy. Wealthy is invisible. So if you were wealthy, you would no one would really know, right? Because wealthy doesn't carry all the symbolization. When most people say I want to be rich, that what they say is I want to be able to spend a million dollars, not have a million dollars. Very few people think about having and keeping. Matter of fact, getting money is easy. 
keeping it is difficult as fuck. <laughs> and so it's really easy that once you grab it and you realize how fragile having money is, then most people who keep money are frugal. Most mil- long-term millionaires, they don't spend money. That's why you're like, man, millionaires seem hella cheap. Real millionaires, yeah. Real wealthy people, yeah. Rich people who go broke relatively fast, no. What you see on television, hip hop, and all this entertainers, they're rich people. Wealthy people don't show you anything. Right? It's like, it's like, like, I don't know if Jay-Z's wealthy or rich. I don't know which mindset he buys into, but he seems like he's buying into wealth. He's learning wealth. And he was teasing because he was wearing Puma the other day. Well, first of all, I think he's sponsored by Puma. That's one. But number two, if I like it, I don't give a fuck. I'm not doing this for you no more. But when you're rich, you're spending money to gain this. And you don't realize you gain more of this through empathy. Right? How you show up to people, how you serve others, how you, who you are as a person. That will spread popularity way faster. Many of us are spending money for popularity, for value, for rec- recognition, for acknowledgement, for, um, you know, I want to show, like, for example, he was saying, he made this point that if a man pulls up in a car and he's in a BMW, nobody says, hey, who's that guy? They say, that car hella clean. I wish I had it. They don't give a fuck about you. But in your mind, you think, yeah, they look at it. They, they just, like, I'm flying. They got, they looking at me. I'm all this. I want to show people that I'm performing. I have a friend right now. You don't spend my own. Sh- this cat makes cash, crazy cash. But if you saw him every day, he's just like a regular, every middle class, lower middle class dude. That time, because he's he's going to fix a house or some shit, and he just look like he doesn't. Like if you if he goes somewhere, he ain't gonna ask you to pay for nothing for him. He'll pay for dinner if if he, he likes to hang out with you, but he won't go if he doesn't make no sense to him. But he's frugal, and so when we when we learn that keeping money. Is different than getting money. And the other thing the book points out, I'm not going to ruin it because the book has so much, I can't ruin it. It's just so much weight. We think about making money through the eyes of getting more. None of us think about making money through saving. We don't, this just doesn't cross our mind. Yeah. We think we got to get more, get more, get more, get more, get more. But as we get more, we continue to adjust our lifestyle to reflect the more because at the end of the day, we're, t- we're tied to our ego. But once you bring, once you realize that if you had took this percentage of money and saved it, and it took that percentage of that money and invested it, you might have four hundred thousand sitting in the bank right now. But the reason you got five thousand dollars in the bank, or or you wait for that next paycheck to show the fuck up, is because your spending habits is causing poverty, not what you are actually have access to. Mm-hmm. So it's there's some there's layers and levels to this complexity around money. That's why I say I can't wait to get in the book because he. He takes it so far into psychology. He gets to the complexity, psychology, but he's also using econ as he discusses it, behavior science. But he's using, from the books I studied and reading this book, it's not pop at all. Not pop science. And then here's a couple questions you can ask yourself, which sounds like you already asked some of those. Is, is A, if I, need, if I wanted to or needed to sell this stuff, would I have any issue selling it? Any emotion selling it. Second question is, um, if you know whatever those answers are, that's what they that's what they are. The second question is why? Why do I have this stuff? And if and if you can answer that question, why you could trace it back to something like you, you might have as a childhood thing or a rejection uh, or growing up without, then then now you have the work to do because you you've solved some of the riddle. But now what's left is the actual work. Because the minute you raise your self-value, then that shit is nothing. I don't give a shit about none of it. It can go tomorrow. Why? Now, if there's a subconscious undercurrent happens when you walk past the mall and you walk past the store and you got to get it, that's dangerous. Because at the next, next level, when you have more power and more money, that can be, that can be harm. It can hurt. Because, I mean... And we humans, right? We humans. There's there's a, a a man or a woman in your life that in the past you was like, I'm done with this person. And you get that text, and you're like, What you doing? Shit. I'm done with this person. I'm going about my business. Hey, let's connect. All right. Because you, that undercurrent in you is overriding your logic and everything. And when that happens, that's da- it's dangerous. There you go. And if you and if you don't lo- learn how to contain that, 
and find stronger whys to be able to re, to over to override it, then at that next next level, then you're gonna be compromising everything you built. Yo, shout out to the homie for asking that question. That's like a real vulnerable question to ask. But um, it's a lot of work involved that you're talking about. Like you want to identify why are you in the shoe store right now? Like I'm here again. And that resonates with me. I'll share that the personal story. But in terms of like a practice of getting control of the potential danger that I think Court is identifying, I think it's a great opportunity to turn that into a powerful like um, opportunity, right? You can now create a way to wield this aspect about your psyche, whatever it is, wherever it stems from, as you said, to like drive you in the now. Um, some s simple psychological kind of like based strategies will just create a, a structure. Say, yo, you know what? I'm only gonna go to the, to the shoe store every other week. So now you got a hold of it. Or when I accomplish this task, I'm gonna go to the shoe store, right? So you could like pencil it in as you do the work that internal self-interrogation, shadow work to understand it, but you can still make use of it because it's there. One day it's not gonna be there and you're gonna need another more powerful motivator to push you forward. But right now it's like, don't miss this moment to reorient something that's a part of you as you unpack it so that you can let it go. Yep, any other questions? Oh, good. So, How's it, them nails are on fire. Thank you. Thank you. On fire. Take this off. I can't breathe. Um, <laughs> so I'm I'm in still in compounding interest, right? I'm at a foundational place with establishing things that I hope will become businesses, right? And I've been at it for less than a year. But in that, um, when I hear y'all talk about emotional agility, what feels natural to me and what I find has been happening is kind of a splitting of self, identifying emotional agility as which version of myself do I feel like I need to bring to X? The nurturing self, the corporate self, the hood self, the sales self, you the do whatever the hood self. Side too. Right, like I feel like I have, <laughs> and to me it feels very efficient and it feels very strategic to bring a specific self intentionally and to hold back another one. Or to say, I know you're a trash ass person, but you might be in a position to do something for me in my emerging business initiatives down the road. So I'm gonna make you think we're good, even though I don't really like you. It feels duplicative, but it also feels effective as hell. And I like doing it, to be honest. I know that probably sounds a little strange, but I like doing it because I feel like it's almost like going through a closet. This is the self we need for that. I think sometimes we over anchor on authenticity because you don't always need to bring who you really are to your business. And I wonder, do y'all feel like that? And do you also think that that's a part of what it means to be emotionally agile? Before you ask that question, how many people are lying with that question? I think that question is in more people's minds than a few. Yeah, I think that's, because I think that's that, I think that's a big question. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so ready to jump into this question, but I think that's a question that I think I've heard of my people echo softly so I think you're really speaking for more than just you. He just articulated it so damn well. Um, I'm like, because Cor is breathing hard, and I never heard him. Like, this feels awkward, so I'm going to let him start first. No, no. <laughs> he's he like, come on, let me get this one out. Like, I'm go here, bro, shit. I mean, honestly, <laughs> You can honestly probably answer this question better than I, because because I the, the reason why I say that is because I, what I'm about to say I learned from you. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, um, no, because it's like it's like you ever got into a fight and your partner just want to hit him first, so he just wait for just him for you to just show that sign of anger, so you can throw the first punch. He'd be like, yo, you you say hit him, like I didn't even say nothing, right? He had that same. <sighs> <laughs> um, okay, so let me say this real quick. Here's the beauty of being an entrepreneur, and I'm going to show you how to get there, is you finally can be yourself 100% all the time, right? And But you are always changing for the greater good, for what really matters. The reason I would not have to tell somebody about themselves, because it doesn't matter to me. 
Two, I'm trying I'm trying to learn more understanding than learn how to be right. See, that's a little bit of right in there. There's a little bit of ego in there. There's a little bit of uh, fairness in there. There's a little bit of social justice shit in there. You might not be social justice subscribed, but that is the cultural rhythm, and your brain is unconsciously dipping in its feet and is adopting some of those values unconscious to yourself. Now, if you're a molester, I'm going to tell you, get the fuck out of my face. I ain't got shit to do, say to you. If you say one more word, I'm going to let him get down, right? Because he, he'll get down too. But the point is this, right? But if you're not something that I think that is harming others, but you're just absolutely ignorant by every definition I can think of in that moment, you're not ignorant to me. I'm gonna, I need to understand why you think that way because that's, that's another perspective I can't see. See, ignorance often is my ignorance that you exist. So as an entrepreneur, the reason I'm curious about finding out about learning about your different views, even when I disagree with them, is because if I'm trying to serve you as a market and I'm trying to push my way, I'm not serving you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to project myself and dominate you, and control you. So every time I have an opportunity to hear an idea or a principle, I'm like, that don't make no fucking sense. I'm like, hey, where, where'd you get that from? How'd you come up with that? And then that discovery, I go, hey, we're working on a new product. Like, hey, did you realize that a group of people think like this? And they wake up every morning and they survive and they, they've grown old believing in these ideas. And yet we're trying to bring them a product over here and we wonder why they won't buy our fucking product. It's because we don't see them. We don't hear them. So the whole, I, the whole premise of you're stupid, you're dumb, that's weak, you're flawed, is us shutting off groups of people who are a potential future market. Two, you're right. When you show up to people, the reason I'm one person is that because I'm a little bit of everything anyway. If you catch me at the wrong time, if you catch me in the morning when I first woke up, I'm kind of mean. I don't want to talk to nobody. Even my daughter says, you just woke up? I was like, yeah, she just walk away. And there's no like my daughter and me, like, that's, I love her morning. Like, anything in the world is like, she just seen me in the morning and she knows at the age of three, all right, I'm out. This is too much, right? You're, it's too, and she's like me too. When she just wake up, just give her a few minutes, right? Uh, and you catch me around my money, I'm conservative as fuck. I make Donald Trump like he's, like he's soft because of my money, right? But when it comes to my community work, I'm probably more loving than Martin Luther King, right? So it just depends on how you catch me. What I'm saying is that all those people that you are, think you're taking off or taking on, you're not really ever doing that anyway. They're always going to pop out any way you want it. That's that undercurrent you're talking about. They don't really get, you don't really get a chance to put them away. You're just one trigger away from one of them people coming out, right? What you have to learn how to do is learn to embrace them all, even your dark side. I'm, dark, I'm talking about your dark, dark side. I'm talking about that late night, a life change colors dark side, right? If you can't accept all of you, there's a portion of you that's controlling you that you don't control. That's one. Number two, once you learn how to make, like, for example, let's say you have a, a, a hood side, all right? Your hood side needs, might need, to be, needs need to be upgraded so it can fit with your business side because they're really the same person anyway. Right? You think business people are just fucking squares and soft? No, they gangsters. They gangsters as fuck. Gangsters but they learn how fuck. to upgrade the hood side so now it works. If you, matter of fact, if you made a real hardcore, like I, I know, like I grew up around some real bosses. When I say bosses, I mean that they had platoons of brothers working for them. And they're just the most peaceful people in the world. But they were really complex and balanced. But when I went to corporate America, I'm like, the same shit. It's the same fucking shit. Could do real, only goons, dumbass, low level goons running around. Argh! I'm mad for no fucking reason. Ah. Real ballers, hey man, they love their families. They got they got lives. They try. They do all kind of shit. They just happen to be in this other world that they somehow rationalize. So those different variations, if they're letting you down in those environments, upgrade them. What happens? You may have given this one such a high upgrade. Now they seem out of balance, so you're almost ashamed of them. Well, just upgrade them. And other people are never the issue. If you show up to people and you're not getting what you want, it's something that has to do with you. Often, let's say I'm not walking down, anybody, Tenille's been around me, right? You've been around me. Catch me in business, I regular, I'm the same dude. You don't, only thing different on Donald Taylor, I'm gonna talk shit and win, right? Not but every outside, time, not <laughs> every time, motherfucker. But not man, every, almost not. all the time though, right? We like, you like three and one right now. <laughs> Okay, he gonna get his statistics anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> gentleman sweep. I'm not a sweeper. I just gentleman sweep. But the point is this. And so let's say, at the end of the day, um, 
I'm always the same dude. But I learned how to build those people into my system where it's consistent. And what didn't work, I dropped it. Why am I holding on the old shit? Right? Because in the, the day, that's trying to keep your feet in two different ponds and wonder why you're not making any progress. You got to let go to go to the next level. You can't stay in the back. You can't stay down here and be talking about I'm up here. One or the other. And when you grow, you change. Fuck what you heard. When you grow, you change. I don't give a fuck. Jay-Z cannot be that hood dude he was on the street. He grew. You won't be... Look, if you start playing basketball and you suck, and, t- and then 10 years in for the NBA, you're not the same person no more. If you grow a business, you start a business as a corner store, and you grow it to be where well, you got 10,000 employees, you cannot be the same person, or otherwise you're going to lose all of that. So your growth is a natural process, but the story we tell ourselves is the friction that we're creating, not the natural growth. So we all are multiple personalities. Let's stop creating a separation Embrace them all, pour into all of them, understand them. Because some of them are trauma too, right? Some of those come from some fucked up spaces that we got to do some work on ourselves. But even in that space, knowing how to bring all that together. Like I say, I, I still got some hood in me because that's, that's the majority of my life to this point. But when it comes out of me, I'm aware, now that you can't be hitting cats in the mouth. Like the last time I cut somebody out, that's why a dude told me to move my motorcycle. I was like, who the fuck you think you're talking to, right? That was like too much. And when I walked away, I was like, dude, what are you doing? Why are you over here about to hit a dude in the mouth because he asked you to move your motorcycle? You know you was wrong. What the fuck wrong with you? This is years back, right? And at that point, I was like, yo, you on some victim shit. You on some, oh, I don't feel value shit. So now you attacking him because you feel like he's reminding you that you don't have value when this is all made up in your fucking head. And so what I'm saying is that there is some growth and some self-investment that needs to happen there. It really ain't the outside world. And you are all those people unapologetically. And some of them just needs to be upgraded. Yeah. Let me, let me add, let me add. So two things, one approaching all those situations with a mindset of service. How effective is it now when you approach those situations as a servant, how much ego is in that now? A lot. Because now, if you approach a situation of service, like a servant, then you're not like, I'm going to put on this and tell this person about this person. Because now those two don't mix. Those two don't mix. Any situation you approach, if you come at it with an of service mentality, it changes it. Because now you're just looking for an outcome. Emotional agility s- says... Emotional agility is real time. It's not planned out. That's why it's called agility, because it gives you real time tools to react and respond right now in this situation. Because what happens when you plan something, you say, I'm a, okay, I'm going to put on this jacket because I, I'm in my mind, I'm projecting this and this is going to happen. So I'm going to put on the hood jacket and you get there and you, you got the wrong jacket on because you need the square jacket. Right. Emotional agility says I have all these jackets in within me in real time. I can respond, but not from a place of ego. Right or wrong. I'm going to tell you about yourself. So I feel my ego feels good because what you said really is feeding the ego. The emotional agility says, how can I get the result? This person's throwing this at me. It, It rolls off me. I'm not tripping. I should, my value is high and my goal is get to the get my end result. So how can I use like a keto, like a, the martial art of keto is using everybody's weight, their punches, their swings against them. So a keto says I, I can be small, frail, I can be light, but but I have these skills that when you swing, I know how to use your own energy against you. And it makes it makes me look like I'm hella strong, like I threw you across the room. But really, I just use your own weight. That's emotional agility. It's saying, okay, I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening. Okay. Um, he he brought some game er, when we earlier in the year. Where what am I listening for? I'm not listening to the words. I'm listening for context, not content. So you're listening for context. Not content. 
oh, I, I feel a little, oh, I hear a little bit of insecurity there. I hear some fear there. I hear some not good enough there. I hear some this there. I hear some that there. And so now I'm going to take these things that I hear in terms of your context and not throw them at you to hurt you or to prove right or wrong, but to get to the solution faster. That's emotional agility. Oh, okay. Um, me, and, me and Jordan work on that all the time at the office. What are, what are they saying? What, is he, what are they saying? What, fuck, fuck, the, fuck his words. That, that coach is saying, I don't trust you yet. I don't trust you yet. I don't trust you yet. That's what I'm. That's what he's saying. So, so what will make you seem like a magician is not be like, oh, he prejudiced, or you don't like me because I'm young. It's like, well, you throw out things that are trustworthy to them, and out the blue, they check those boxes. Oh shit. Okay. Okay. Got you. Cool. Because I'm trying to get to the end. I'm trying to get to the solution. You move like that. You. Fuck your right and wrong. Fuck they right and wrong. Fuck you being right. You proving who you are as a black woman. And none of that shit. It's get to the goal. Um, and soon you don't need the jacket. You don't need to think about, okay, I'm going to put on the jacket. You just show up. And you show up your authentic self. To me, the beauty about th showing up your authentic self, that's why I'm like, as much as I want to answer, I'm a, because I, I learned it from him. I always naturally moved with my authentic self because I didn't have nothing else anyway. So even when I tried to like talk with the white voice, they'd be like, ah, I know who you are underneath that. Now you ain't getting me. My white voice wasn't good. So I, I didn't have no choice but to be able to move and succeed with who I was. But really coming here is where I really solidified it. Because when you show up with dreads in a hoodie, the person on the other side of the room is already calculating in their head your value. Da -da 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 -da. Dreads, hoodie, Jordan, sagging pants, this, that, the other. Okay, this person is, okay, he's value low. And then when you open your mouth and, sp and spit that fire of what you know in your content, in your education, in your experience, in your results, and what you're good at, and, and, and how you can serve them, and how you served others, and the value of your service, and here's the results and the answers. Then they're like, oh shit, the, the, the distance between where they valued you and where you showed up is gonna look like magic. And they're gonna think you amazing. And they're gonna champion you, and they're gonna talk talk to others about you. Not if you showed up, if you if they valued you at, at a two and you showed up at an eight, that distance of six is mind blowing to a person. Even if their competitor showed up at a nine, but they expected a nine, they're still gonna think you better. That's what makes you don't showing up authentically more valuable than trying to posture and be like, I'm going to put on my bougie white voice today and think I'm going to impress these people. Anytime you do that, they automatically devalue you too because you're an imposter. They know that ain't you. They know that ain't you. So they're like, uh huh, look at this person trying to mimic me. You put yourself automatically under them. Instead, you show up like yourself. Man, what's happening? They come to shake your hand. I, gra I grab the hand. I do it I, like a Wayne's brother episode. <laughs> I do that shit. And, th and then now they're like, damn, you're not trying to be like me? No, I'm 100% in myself. And they're like, now they're like shook because they're like, damn, that's, that rarely happens because black people don't do that. So now I'm like, what's up, blood? What's happening? What you doing? I'm shit, just chilling. And then we start talking business and I'm like, okay, so here... Boom, and I break it down. Their mind's blown. I seen it. I learned it here. I solidified it here. So, so don't ever, in emotional agility, just make set on steroids. Because now you don't, your, all your prep time is backed by agility. It's like you a boxer, and you, you, know, you practice all these moves with the mitts, right? Nobody comes at you where you hit one, two, duck. <laughs> Nobody, nobody does that shit. You don't know what you're going to get hit with. Wait, wait, good, wait, don't hit me. Good hit me trainers, go. gonna, they're training for everything. Yeah. That's emotional agility. So let me ask you real quick, real quick, side note, side note. What part of your personality do you think would not work in business?
the part that's not curious. <coughs> the part that's not curious? What do you mean? The part that tends to lean on my own experiential knowledge to answer questions rather than being curious and asking. Okay, so you so the part of this make, assumes mm -hmm. yeah, the part the, the part the part that thinks fuck what you said I know I know what I'm I know what I'm doing. I, I didn't say that, but but that's kind of that's what it does, right? Based on my own experience, yes. Right, right. right. So so now let me ask you something. Do you like that part? Period. Does that, if it just if it if business didn't exist, do you like that part of your personality? Sometimes. When do you like it? When it's right. When it works. When it works, when is it? Show me when it works. When I can util, utilize my time efficiently because I already know an outcome based on an experience. I know, but I'm saying when you work with other people, not when you by yourself. I mean, I'm sure when you by yourself, you could be as, as, as rigid dictator you want to be when you're in the bathroom by yourself. <laughs> when you're with other people, when does that work? It can be a time saving, even like when working with other people. Let's not do A because I've done A and B happened. I don't know for a fact that it would happen the same way, but I'm making an inference based on my own experience. Let's not do that because this is a like, likely, not a guaranteed outcome, but it's likely. So I sense there's some emotions to that. Why, why do, you get, do, you get, do you get sensitive if somebody tells you, no, I'm going the other way? No, I think people should do whatever they want to do. And, no, you I, don't. and I think sometimes that registers as. Feedback challenged, right? If you say, no, I'm going to do what I want to do. I understand your experience, but let me go have my own experience and find out. Right, but well, okay, are we talking group or individualism? Group. Okay, so, but you keep straddling the fence. You can't stay on one side for whatever. Because when I throw something at you, you go back to, you run, you, you retreat back to individualism. But when I said, talk to you about the group behavior, which is we're in a group setting right now, and you said sometimes you know what's best, and people just need to do what you say. No, not what I say. Sometimes I feel that I know what is best. I will go along to get along. So, okay, so the In world is, true. let's say you are aware how the world is very, very complex, right? And mm -hmm. knowledge is so vast. And knowledge did not start the day you were born and it's not, it's not suppressed to fit what you need to know. So you realize how complex life is. Now, do you realize that one, ba one man doesn't win a basketball team and one man can't build a corporation by himself? Absolutely. So there's no one man can build a team. So... If you're talking about group, how are you not valuing the value of those who surround you over your own personal limitations and your biases? I think I'm getting a lot better at that because I've become a lot more conscious of it through being in this class. But I do feel the effort that it takes to just say, okay, even though my thought is something different, okay, in order to go along to get along, uh, in order to not appear to not be able to work within feedback, or just in order to see if that outcome ends up being the correct thing. And I'm talking about when you're working in a group, because I don't know everything, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But do you see how this is an ego-based conversation, how you're serving yourself? You're not serving the outcome? See, the outcome is the most important thing on the table. Mm -hmm. I don't give a shit where the answer comes from. Like what Steph Curry said, I, I just want an NBA. Or we just want a championship. You going to ask me about me MVP, like we just won the fourth championship. Fuck, fuck me, right? That was a, the dopest answer I've ever seen. What you've been arguing is how you feel, what you thought, your your, your core basis of you making a, a, a critical decision that's going to impact other people is like I felt this, and you know I felt like that was, my critical analysis is what I feel, and if I feel, I think scientists should just ask me about life because I can tell you what I feel, right? Because if somebody else said it to you, you'd be like, wait, what? That's what you just said to me. But then when I asked you earlier, hey, don't you want to get rid of that? He goes, no, sometimes I feel it. Sometimes. But I'm saying, even though you feel it, why are you saying you wouldn't get rid of it? Or you don't want to grow past it? I do want to grow past it. I okay. think that sometimes it's because I'm starting to come to understand that it's limited. So, so, so go back to parts of you just need to be upgraded and that's where the conflict is happening because as you had this conversation now the conversation you just had wasn't a flaw it's what the human brain does it confuses the fuck out of us 
It creates contradictions that seem like it's all one straight stream when there are contradictions that are working against each other, creating friction that's taking you down, right? It wasn't you. It was human. And I, I tapped into your human rhythms, not a tapping into you. And I promise you, everybody in this room has something in life, they do the exact same process. I promise you this. It's the most... It's, it's a thing that we kind of constantly work. When we talked about mental health last week, if we don't constantly challenge the mental distortions that are being plugged into our brain, they start to become harmonized. And then our plus and negatives are working against each other as opposed to working with each other. And so at the end of the day, it's like when I talked to you, I knew you was not going to say, fuck the outcome. It's all about me. I knew that. That's because that's, that's, that's what you would have to say the direction I was taking you in. I was leading you to a point where you either have to say, fuck, fuck this business, fuck everybody else, fuck my family. If I ain't happy, fuck y'all, right? Now, I knew you was not going to say that. But your principles and how you led into it was that. And I want you to see that connection. But that's the, going back to you, that's the process of how we discover these inconsistencies in ourselves that's creating this natural friction in our journey because we don't continue to dive deeper, 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 deeper. And we did it in a short exercise, but I did it on purpose because I wanted folks to see this is what you need to do with yourself all the time. So it wasn't about you and you weren't, it has no reflection on ignorance, it's biases, it's mental distortions, and they're unconscious to your brain. So it's not like you consciously be like, yeah, I got mental distortions, I don't give a fuck, that's who I am. That's not who you are. You are a very intelligent person who do got hood in you? Because you go places I will never go. Um, but, you, you know, apartment C type shit. But anyway, put it this. And so the thing is that anybody from Oakland, I'll be like, apartment C, ooh, shit. Because that's some, apartment C is real. Um, but the thing is that, but what I wanted to show you how these IDs, personas that we built up, they're not explored properly. We just left them as sitting, floating labels in our brain that's causing more damage. And until we take control of them, they're adding ideas that don't even go with our core ideas. That's the power I was trying to get you to. That's why I want you to just go through this down this path of seeing that disconnect and be like, what the fuck am I saying? I don't believe that shit. Ultimately, I want to get here. This is, I want to build shit. I don't want to sit here and just be fanning myself in the kitchen by myself. So that's why I wanted to take you down. But so please pay attention if you get a chance to rewind the video. This wasn't about Kaja. This was already about you. Kaja just is Kaja just asked some of the most amazing questions that allows me to go a little bit further into some of these subjects. So Kaja, thank you. So let's keep it pushing because I want to, I want to, some things I want to fit, get, get to you before this, this last class. So let's, let's move on. And if we have some time with more questions, we can hit them out, hit them at the end. Thanks. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Answer and answer. So, what do we really want? What do we really want? Why are we here? Why are we really here? Why are you guys sitting in this chair on a Wednesday night listening to this, listening to us talk? Why are we sitting here? So the question, you got you to gotta always be asking yourself, what, what, why am I here? What do I really want? Because a lot of us on this side of the table is we want something different. You want something better, you want something different, you want a certain kind of change in your life. Some, some of you don't even know what you want, you just don't know, want what you got right now. Right? But you want change, you want something different. Why are we here? Why are you here, Nana? Oh, right now? Why are you here? It's too long, keep going. Why is it too long? But it has to do with black folks. We here for our purpose, black folks. We love y'all as an as a, as a individual and a collective. We, uh, we here on Wednesday nights, not for anything else but, but your results and your success. Yeah. I, get, it's, I get my daughter half the week. Wednesday is my, Wednesday is my day too. So I, got, I, I sacrifice one evening of hanging out with my daughter to come here because I want – impact not no popularity shit not no status shit because none of that matters to me is how can we impact how can we add value how can i give any kind of nuggets that i've gotten along my path 
that can help you sp help speed up your journey. It's the, it's, it's the outcome. It's your revenue. It's the report card of your bank account that gets me high. And you say, like, damn, I didn't did. Man, I, my, I'm doing these numbers. I'm doing this in business. That's, what, that's why we're here. But you got to also ask, why are you here? You got to know. You got you to ask yourself the question. And when you can come up with your whys, your whys are the are really what 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 move you. The if you don't have a strong why, then you won't have a strong business. If you don't have a strong why, you don't have a strong business. The reason being, if your why is not strong, you could get chipped off along the way easy. Any distraction along the way that's a little bit stronger than your why currently is going to chip you off. You're done. You out. You're done. It's over. So anytime you want to do or not do something, it always, a lot of times it comes down with you, to your why. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? Why do we rarely ever miss a Wednesday night? Ever. I think once, two, twice, I think one time I was gone, maybe if that, because of the purpose that is strong. Why, why do you, entrepreneurship is some of the hardest shit you can do. Sometimes you want to, I know I walk around sometimes look like a crazy person because of all the different stresses that hit you every, why do we do it? Because a purpose is strong. So you, you have to get comfortable with understanding your whys. Like you talked about with the shoe shit. Why do I dig into it? Why am I doing this? Some of you, are engaging in activities that you don't, your why has died off a long time ago. It's just habit now. That's why if you really took a mental inventory of why, you probably like, what? I don't even, you mean to tell me I don't even like this no more? I just do it because that's just part of my routine? Man, fuck this shit. I'm done. Always be taking mental inventory of your whys because that is going to drive you. It's going to continue to bring you here. If not, this next six months is going to be hard. It's going to be hard for you. But the whys are going to be like, damn it, I didn't understand that at all. Let me go listen to that again. You mean another, th you're going to listen to a, a three hour thing again? Absolutely. Absolutely. They say, hey, um, how do you, he asks, how do you critique your um, classes, Court? I watch them again. You mean you watch the whole fucking thing again? Yeah. That's the only way I'm going to get better. Sometimes I think I killed that shit. And the next day I'll be like, what the fuck was I doing? The stupid ass. That helps me grow. Why would I do that? Because... Of, of what we said earlier, the purpose, the outcome, what we want as black people. We went to we went to Tulsa. <coughs> he told you. I wanted to. I'm about to tell you a story, and, and I'm gonna give you a, some content, pr some precursor. This story is gonna be emotional. I'm doing this on purpose. I wanna I wanna I wanna uh, hook you with my story. You you won't be able to do nothing about it. Ready? Okay. So, I wanted to go to Tulsa. I mean, we went to Tulsa. I saw Black Wall Street. Black Wall Street's down there. So, that's an entrepreneur story. Black entrepreneurs in a thriving business. Imagine that. In the 1920s, a whole strip full of thriving black businesses. Whole strip. 40 blocks. 40 blocks. Hotels, restaurants, um, barber shops. Everything that an ecosystem needs to thrive. Black businesses and entrepreneurs hooking up with other entrepreneurs and saying, yo, why don't you come over here and put a hotel across the street from my hotel? Well, we competitors. I ain't tripping. I'll loan you some of the money to get started. I just need your, I just need your black ass here. And it was thriving. Millionaires. Booming. Black. A, a whole neighborhood full of bougie, beautiful black people. And then in two days, some jealous poor white people destroyed that shit and killed lots of black folks. 
Lots of black folks. It's hard not to be hooked by the story, right? It's hard not to, even though I said, you, you ain't gonna be nothing you could do about it. <laughs> because it's real. And it happened. It fucking happened. But I wanted to go see it. Not to get in victim mode or victim mentality or be like, the white man, we can't do nothing. No. Because like I said, if it's raining hellfire, then we got to figure out, hmm, what can we do to prevent this next time as an entrepreneur? Radical responsibility says that. What can I do? Like I, said, I got two years. It could be smallpox, motherfucking whatever. As long as if it lasts two years, I'm good. Because there's shit that you have to figure out to be to, to prevent. Same in this situation. Anything you build, you have to be prepared to protect. I just needed the juice. I didn't really necessarily care about the story. I just needed the juice. The motivation, the inspiration piece of it. Our, like Now, any other person who gets caught in that social justice trap can walk in there and be like, nothing, we can't do nothing. What's the use in building something? Nah, that's not the that's not the moral of the story for me. It's what can we continue to do that they built that we can continue to propel and do better? Because eventually, what compound interest states is eventually it will morph into a powerful system that's sustainable and growable. As long as you keep compounding. And so that fuels my why. So I needed, I just needed to pour a little bit into my why. Because I was like, I'm having a, it's a tough year for me in a good way. Stressful year in a good way. So you get kind of weird. I get kind of, I just need to pour my why. Man, I came home back ready to rock and fucking roll. Ready to rock and roll. A little bit too serious right now, but it's going to wear off and I'm going to get like a little goofy later. But I, I'm back serious, like I'm, I'm mugging. But I just need to fuel, fuel some of my why. What's your why? 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 Why are you doing it? Why are you here? And if it's if you sluggish, your why is weak. Next slide. Now, grit versus quit. Grit versus quit. So, in the book, emotional agility, is saying. That, that toughness you need as an entrepreneur to not quit when shit gets hard, that toughness you need as an entrepreneur to keep pushing through the sludge, the friction, the grind, that toughness you need, at what point does it become stupidity? <laughs> at what point? At what point? So then if you're very gritter, gritty by nature, then quitting is not an option for you, Right? You're not necessarily the problem. It's the people that quit all the time. Shit. Soon as I bump up against a challenge, I don't want to do it no more. Soon as I bump up against a challenge, maybe the universe is telling me not to do it. Soon as I bump a sign from God that this ain't good. All that's bullshit. If you quit at the first sign of, of difficulty, challenge, trouble, then you're weak. But, but the question can get confusing. Well, when is it a good idea to quit something? And when is it a good idea to keep moving? So there's no one, one answer suits all situations. It's not, uh, it's not a recipe formula I can give all of you. But you got to know. A lot of times you know. You know. When it, if, if it's hard, it's just hard. When it's hard, it's just hard. Man, this shit is hard. Man, this shit is hard. Well, keep going. Keep going, sis. Keep going. Never quit something just because it's hard. Because what that hardness is doing a lot of times is preparing you to handle it. You ever hear that saying, I don't ask God uh, to take it away. I ask him for strength. Because Everybody wants to get to the next level, right, of from where they are. Is that true? Everybody wants to get to the next level? Show of hands. Is that true? Everybody wants to get to the next level. I do too. 
Well, the next level for you is hard right now. It's hard. It's hard. We got a Street Fighter um, arcade game in our office. So um, me and my, my uh, coworkers battle each other all the time, go at it with each other. Well, this motherfucker secretly changed it from level one to level four. So I come into the office one day and I get my ass whooped by the first man. I'm like, wait, I'm usually can get to like seven. What's going on? Am I weaker? What's going on? So after two days, he's like, ah, I changed it. So then I'm like, leave it, leave it. I just want to test a theory. Just leave it. So in my brain, it's impossible to get past the first man. It's just like predict too fast, predicting everything that I do. Uh, so I'm now I'm blaming it on the controls. Well, the technology is technically too slow for how fast the CPU is going. I'm trying to come up with these fucking excuses, but instead I'm like, nope, keep going. Maybe about a month later, the first man is easy. Then the second man is easy. Then the third man is easy. And now I'm up to like the fourth man right now. So, so what's hard is not what, what used to be hard. So never ask for never ask for things to be easier. You ask for you to get stronger. Because what you want is on that other side of the hard. Now, you know when it's time to quit. Like when it's time to quit, a lot of times you look around you and everything's gone. You lost everything. You still tr tr trudging away. <coughs> the resources gone, the people around you gone, the mentors are gone, people who gave you advice are gone, your employees gone, your customers gone, everybody gone. So that's that's a harmony answer that you have to answer, but but understand the, the difference. And then if we go to the next slide, which it's gonna give you a couple nuggets. Shabisha. Emotional agility can help one develop grit since it allows us to unhook from difficult emotions and thoughts, manage setbacks, and identify our values so we move toward a long-term goal worth pursuing. But it also allows us to let go of those goals once they no longer serve us. You catch the nugget. Did you catch the nugget? The nugget is in the grit versus quit qu question, it's how much emotion is in this thought process because once you remove the emotion from the, the grit versus quit question then it makes it easier for you to see if it's a smart move or not smart move the answer is in the emotion if I take the emotion out if you're like it's just hard and everybody you know, you know this is happening to me in my life and it seems logical for it to quit but if you remove the emotion and say, okay, now is it is it uh, is this a goal worth pursuing or not? You see clearer. That's what emotional agility allows you to do. And you can see if something no longer serves you, meaning it doesn't add value to your life no more. So if you walk it and you got hallways and hallways full of shoes, and when you go look at your shoes, you feel nothing. quit it's not serving you it doesn't serve you maybe it's another thing that, that can give you sparks a little joy in 10 percent or five percent of your time but <coughs> remove the emotion removing the emotion is one major key i feel like dj Khaled. It. it's a major key let's keep going But emotional agil agility leaves room for the considered decision to quit something that is no longer helping you. And that can be a very good thing. How many times, how many lives have been wasted by sons doggedly following in their father's footsteps, pursuing a father's dream, even though those steps and dreams led in directions that held no intrinsic value, intrinsic appeal to the dutiful son. Sheesh. I, 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 that hit me. I know it may hit some of y'all. I'm a hooper. I'm a hooper. I love hoop. To, I love hoop. I had two sons. Yes, I had a son. The hoop. 
we decorated his room, hoop. He had a hoop above his crib, hoop, hoop, hoop everywhere. Jerseys. He grew up in jerseys, four months old in Jersey. Warriors game. I just sat him there. We couldn't barely hold his head up. You're going to watch this motherfucking game. Seventh grade, dad, I don't want to hoop no more. I don't like it. I don't like it. Oh, shit. Oh, it hurt my heart. I'm glad he had the courage. I'm glad he had the courage. Because if not, he would have been dragging along with some dream that wasn't even his. My youngest son, on the other hand, he he was a he was a hooper. He is a, it was in his blood. But my oldest, no, I'm I don't mm -mm, I'm not in a competition like that. I'm an artist. I like to design, draw this kind of. A lot of us are running programs that was put in in us from from our parents. You ain't even happy. You just trying to still uh, appease your parents. I, I want them to be proud of me. I want them to say good job. I want them to say I approve of what you're doing. If we talk in previous slide, if it doesn't add value to you, quit that shit. You're in a relationship, and if you took your emotions out and realized that emo that relationship has zero value, matter of fact, it's toxic or it's detrimental to you, quit that shit. If you're in a religion, I'm sorry, I don't, you know, it's real though. If you're in a religion and you just been going to this religion because it was your parents' religion, and the whole time you're like, oh no. You got que hella questions that can't be answered in your whole life. Them questions that haven't been answered and that religion doesn't add value to your life. Quit that shit. There's lots. There's other spiritual practices that are out there that could suit you if that's what you want to do. This isn't a right or wrong game. This is a value to you game. If you got this weird, you know, belief or ideal that fucking aliens come down and give you special powers at night when you're sleeping and you wake up and you actually perform higher, keep that shit. Who cares? It was shit. As long as it's working for you. I got all kind of weird shit that he caps on all the time. I don't give a fuck because it, it works for me right now. I'll bring, I'll bring Sage up here if, it, if he wasn't here. That shit stink. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that shit smells like that nasty ass coffee. <laughs> but that's my that's my. Per now the the dope part is this though, and this is where we brothers at. Is that if in any moment it stops adding value for me, it stops working for me, it's gone like a bad habit. It's gone. It's gone, and it gets tried, and t it gets, it's gone. And they get laughed at and capped on the next day too. Let's let's go to the next slide. If you're faced with a grit or quit decision, here are some things to ask yourself. One, overall, do I find joy or satisfaction in what I'm doing? Two, does this reflect what is important to me, my values? Three. Does this draw on my strengths? Four, if I'm completely honest with myself, do I believe that I or this situation can really be a success? Five, what opportunities will I give up if I um, persevere with this? And then six, am I being gritty or am I being stupid? <laughs> hey, so... <clears throat> answering these questions will a prevent you from being a business hopper right just hopping from business to business when shit's not working that's why when forex came people like, what do you think about forex i don't give a fuck about forex bitcoin any of these new f fads that happen the reason why i don't move is because what i'm doing i'm expanding it's working i'm growing it why would i change directions when what i'm working on is growing. It's not when you have fear or you have you quick to quit, you're going to jump on the next thing or the next thing or the next thing. There's lots of pivots within your own business that you can do. Instead of thinking about other things outside of what you're doing. 
But these these questions will help you really get to the to the meat of whether or not something is great or quit. Next slide. How do we lead by example in business and at home? Well, that's a good question. Think about that. So all this, uh, everything that we do, everything that we learn, everything that we teach, there's pressure there. There's pressure there. Man, I got an employee that works, that goes, I met in this class that works at my company. <laughs> you, that's pressure, motherfucker. Like, I got to show up. I got to show up how I, how I teach the class at work all the time. Because if not, he would like, this motherfucker be saying all this shit up there and I'm be doing shit. Now, I, I'm, I'm human. I'm not, of course I'm human. But that, that's good pressure. What it does is it forces you to always be practicing what you're speaking. Now, when you're learning, the goal is to practice what you learn. Because if you're saying, oh, man, hey, this is a dope class called Hope, and they look at you like, well, I hope you using the shit because it sure don't look like it. <laughs> that A, it's a reflection on the class, and it's a reflection on how you're disseminating and using the information. So the goal is, is to move like people are watching you. Move like people are watching you. Can I just say something? Watch yourself. Um, Self-awareness can compromise this. If you think because you know this, you are this, or when you, you can talk about this if people ask you a question, and you can execute, you can be example when you're aware you're being example. This question is even more of a statement that aligns with your, when you're unaware of what you're doing. Um, I will watch my daughter as my wife for something, and she's really focusing on something else. And she just hear a portion of the question and she'll show up, right? And in her showing up, she really missed what my daughter asked her because she wasn't present enough to hear it. Or the other day, she bought in the house, um, this story, this little white girl was cute as hell. And she was talking about to her why she didn't want to tell her grandfather Happy Father's Day because he's like, that ain't my daddy, that's my papa. And she's going through this whole thing. And my wife's like, oh, my God, this is so funny. She reminds me of Savannah. This little girl is so cute. But my daughter's sitting right there. And my little daughter, my daughter thought, oh, is that how I'm supposed to act? So then my daughter went into a, a whole 10-minute soliloquy about acting like the little girl. Right? She didn't realize in her excitement for this video, she was communicating a message to the child. So a lot of times being like, how do we lead by example? It's not necessary. what are you projecting. You have to become so self-aware that you can create some kind of consistency. Otherwise, when your awareness is turned off, you're giving people an, another example and you're a living contradiction. Mm -hmm. So self-awareness, mm -hmm. this only works with deep, deep self-awareness um, and always seeking your biases, always trying to see yourself through the eyes of other people around you. Mm. And for you social justice people, that's hard as fuck because you want to be right and safe and good. Mm. All right, let's hit this last just, slide. Just, last slide. We, we write your, just write your question down so we can get to you. Don't want to get to these questions that you guys have, but I want to just roll through these real quick, but I just wanted to add to it because he's rolling. I want to know because he's almost done. Yep. So this is the last slide, and then we're going to go to questions. Um, but but this, is, this wraps up emotional agility in a nutshell. Emotional agility is the absence of pretense and performance. It gives your actions greater power because they emanate from your core values and core strength, something solid and genuine and real. We reach that level of real, that level of emotional agility, not through magic, but through a series of tiny steps and everyday moments over the course of a lifetime. Woo! That's so tight. So, they emanate from, what's, the, what's our word of the day? They emanate from your undercurrent. So when it emanates from your undercurrent, there's a realness about it. And guess what? In this fake-ass world, no matter what color you are, people love people who are real. 
So that's just this is I think Kaja, this is a deep one for you. People love people who are real. They don't care. They don't care what you do. Now I feel safe around you. I feel like I can talk to you because you're real. Man, you real. Have like have any most of us from the Bay, from Oakland, right? Have you ever b- went out of town and for some reason some cities like L.A., New York, they love Oakland people. Why? And they usually say the same shit just because y'all are so real. I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? I don't get it. But because, because when you don't have performance, we don't have performance up here. We don't have pre- when you don't have pretense, now everything you say has power because they believe you. They believe you. The thing is, whenever you front for people or you put on these different personas, whether or not they they gonna nod and say yes or no, they sense it. So their brain is gonna be like, this shit, motherfucker's fake. Fake. So the minute you get that that a stamp of being fake, you lose your power. You lose your authority. You lose your ability to negotiate, um, influence people because they feel that fakeness. <clears throat> the real magic is when you change every single day, you make tiny tweaks to yourself. This shit ain't overnight. I'm emotionally agility in every fucking day. And it's been years and years and years and years of practice, especially if you came from traumatic households, abuse, situations where your life was pretty fucked up as a child you got work to do and you're gonna be doing that work for the rest of your life i'm gonna be doing sometimes i'm like a vietnam veteran oh the fuck oh shit and i'll say some shit or some slick shit or be ready to slap somebody or look around the room or think all that is just past trauma that that it prevents you from being emotionally agile the goal is to be able to sit in any situation take a deep breath prior to emotion and say, what is my intent? What do I want to do? What do I want to do? And that's how you'll be powerful in any situation. All right, question. So yeah, Shabisha, Marquita, Shakina. Shabisha wants to go first. You you actually, um, there were a couple questions online that you actually answered. Oh. Through the conversation, they was like, "We good." Okay, okay. Um, but uh, can you go back into compound interest? Adrian said something online that I thought was interesting. He said, "What's up, know, Adrian?" He said, "It feels like people understand compound interest when it comes to compounding problems or compounding challenges." So. They, they understand it. They don't understand it. They do. He was like, they get compound interest when they, like they. They, they don't get don't they don't get compounded problems. Most people, people don't get compounded. You get you look at problems linear, so you see causations, which mm-hmm. is often sometimes correlations, causations mm-hmm. mixed all together. Mm-hmm. Causations is this happened because this happened because this happened this because this happened right. Mm-hmm. Compounding is how a simple habit. Negative, negative have performed over and over can have huge outcomes that seem so small, right? Something that seems so small, like you know, like, like you, like you, you tell a dude, "Hey man, I don't like the color of your T-shirt," and he kills you. And you're like, "That's just too much." <laughs> it's that extreme of a difference of contrast to your brain. You're like, "So you mean this little small thing over here has caused all of this over here?" And it could be something so small, right? Earlier when we said, you know, it's a clue, it's going back to the same, it's kind of still all tied together, that you're making small changes because when those small changes start to expand, they become insane. And a lot of times, like lacking self-awareness is allowing future problems to grow out of control. So it may not be that major one. See, compounding doesn't have, when you first go to the gym, your body don't even look no different. Like if you, like if let's say you're overweight and, um, like just say you just seriously, seriously overweight to the point that you gotta uh, um, get somebody to help you stand up. Um, you work out one day at the gym, and it's not like the next day gonna be able to stand up. You still can't stand up, right? But if you stay with that process and you slowly through increments, when three years you might be able to actually jog around, or five years maybe jog around the block, right? But that first year seems meaningless. Well, it works both ways. Compounding is almost invisible in its early stages. It's only an act of faith. 
But once the compounding starts to unfold, it feels like blessings of God because it starts to pour on you a magnitude you can. So imagine this person starts out training, give you, let's go back to that same person. So right now they got diabetes, they got all these illnesses, they got, um, they have, they, they, they have low self-esteem. They have all these combination of things. Whereas they lose weight, they're not just losing weight. They're losing a multitude of other stuff that creates these combinations that tie into other feelings, other outcomes, other relations. So 10 years from now, they may be living a life that is outside their imagination, meaning you can't even imagine through compounding the the other side of the compounding, right? Like when you, for example, I didn't imagine me ever being here. I couldn't see it. Uh, anybody told you that, oh, I always knew you, you're a goddamn lie. It doesn't work that way. Compounding is an invisible process you can imagine, and most people cannot most people don't even keep track of clear causations to understand how what happens is in our judgment, we often see some kind of kind of compounding process. Like that's why they're here. Cause if their asses would have just went to school, right. It's like, okay, hold on freeze, Pip. There's a lot more layers and complexities and stuff like that. So I would argue that compounding, I don't think compounding is ever visible to human beings mm. because the way that we talk, the way we tell stories, the way we think, the way we process, the way we move our short term focus um, but if you can ever learn to feel compounding without seeing it, it's almost like you can walk through walls. I can't, I can't begin to tell you how that shit's insane. Hey, here, here's a couple examples. <clears throat> Two people have relations, right? You understand me? You, you have one egg, one splits in two. Splits in four, splits in eight, splits in 16. And in 180 days, you have a baby. A baby from compounding, from compounding because it keeps doubling and keeps splitting. In 180 days. Now, the first five months or so, you can barely see. Most of the time, you can barely see. Some people don't really show five months. Around six months, you start showing. And then two months later, you have the baby. That's compounded. That's compounding, the power of compounding. It happens so fast on the, on the tail end of the compounding that next thing you know, you, you, boom, a baby, eight pounds, nine ounces, crying, eyes, ears, everything functions. If you were to spend sixty dollars a day and invest it in t with a ten percent return, you take sixty dollars a day and you have a ten percent return in eighteen years, you'd be a millionaire. I think it's shorter than that. It's compounding. It's pretty short. At ten percent. At ten percent. That's just a conservative ten percent. So. And again, the little money, the little sixty dollars at the beginning is nothing. One eighty. Uh. You know, there's an argument that says that reason a lot of people are billionaires and millionaires. Not, we're not talking about the dot com overnight success. That's a new. That's a new formula. A different game. We're talking about traditional people who built millions. They didn't become millionaires because they were smarter than you. They became millionaires because they had stick to witness. That's it. And they benefited from compounded growth. That's it. So it wasn't that they were special, godly, or smart. It's just that when he finally kicks in, it looks magic to you. It does. You take Elon Musk, right? He built a little software company that he sold and then did PayPal. And then he sold. And then he invested that into another business. And Like, like his, in his mind, he has a purpose. He's not, bruh, I think I read something to where he... Um, Sold his company for a hundred and eighty something million, and and invested it all in the Tesla and SpaceX, and it was doing bad. He was sleeping on the homie's couch. He he's sleeping on the homie's couch because in his brain, his his plans and his goals and his mission is bigger. And so that's how that those things compounded. So it it's. You can't, it's hard to fathom, it's hard to fathom it. Um, 
But when you play it and you do it, it's it's crazy. If if I say, hey, let's play a round of golf. Let's play 18 holes, and we'll do 10 cents a hole. But at at the end of 10 cent, at the end of every hole, we double it. Oh, you'll be broke. You'll be kill you. We'll double it. You, you want to play out the math real quick? Is that only 18 holes, right? Which is so your brain goes, it's not 10 cent plus 10 cent plus 10 cent. It's 10 cent times 10 cent times 10 cent times 10 cent. If you do that math, watch where you, you land. You'll be like, holy shit. Round one, hole one, 10 cents. Hole two, 20 cents. Eh, it's nothing. Hole three, 40 cents. Nothing. Hole four, what? 80 cents. Hole five, what? Dollar sixty. Hole six, what? 320. What you going to do with 320? Nothing. What's hole seven? Huh? 320, 640. No, no, no. He's, he's times. It's times, not pluses. It's, it's double. It's double. No, no. So if it's two, 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 it'd be every time times next number times next time. This is next time. So one plus one times one is is one times two is two, and then two times four, two times two is four, four times four is sixteen, six times sixteen, ten twenty four. No, 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 no. Hold on. Let, let's stop. Let's stop. Let's stop. Let's stop. Quickly, we're we just double it. Let's just double the numbers. Compound is doubling the numbers. So, so we were at a dollar, tw huh? By the time you get to eighteen. Oh, oh. So, <laughs> so for the purpose of this exercise, we're gonna not do this because it, we start fucking it all up. <laughs> But you're, you're going to get into the hundreds of thousands at hole 18. You're getting into the hundreds of thousands starting at 10 cents. That's compound interest. And you can, like, do the math on your own, but that's compound interest. More questions? Marquita. Thank you, sir. Um... Going back to the example of Shakira and Nzinga, and we were talking about self-awareness. Mm -hmm. The biggest part of that, though, was the feedback, right? So if Nzinga had a just quietly felt how she felt, and it wasn't clear that she thought, oh, that's how I'm supposed to act, that could have been a moment that no one realized, like when we were talking about self-awareness, I was sitting here thinking like, how do I master that? And then the thought was, the biggest part of that was the feedback. Radical responsibility is actually the way you master it. Because, okay, so the reason most people don't see themselves in those spaces or see what they're saying, how it shows up to everybody else, is because you, you train your brain when something goes wrong to go, that's Kaja. Kaja, Kaja, you fucking, man, you be fucking my life, oh, Kaja, you, man, right? I don't think about, well, if this happened and it went wrong, let's say Kaja, Kaja did A and B, but what role did I play in it, right? That's the invisible things that no one really talks about in society. We're used to saying, oh, you know, Warriors lost because the referee, the coach, the other player, da, da, da. No, you, start with you. And then that's that. And so if I want to be a better player, that gives me where do that starts to make, make me aware of. Damn, my crossover is not as strong as I thought it is. Oh, when I do this, this is the way players are showing up. If I do this, this is the way play. So you realize that oh, the players are. I'm actually dictating the players. The players are not dictating me, right? And so then your awareness goes up. But gossiping, blaming others, creates almost like a uh, a skin over our eyes where we can't see. Being our, ourself close enough, right? Also, too, um, you gotta accept. Like, we've been a few. We've been we've been abused so long about smart versus dumb, good versus bad. There's no such thing. The smarter you are, the more dumb you realize you really are, right? And when I claim intelligence, that's my ego because it doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't. Like, like Jordan, he's youngster, right? I might be smart in some. But if I walk into his circle, 
I'm going to feel stupid as hell, right? But we've often been abused underneath that weapon, especially if we went to poor schools where, you know, if you're smarter and this kid's dumber, that means you're superior, one is inferior. So we're, a lot of times we're guarded by feedback because we don't hear feedback. We hear you're wrong or you're dumb. That's what all we're really hearing. We're not hearing, we're not hearing, oh, there's a better way. Let me share this with you, right? I was telling Josh, because I was talking to Josh earlier, and Josh started to kind of retract from me a little bit. I could sense that he wasn't feeling some of the feedback. And I say, Josh, I know, because mind you, I said, Josh, I want you to pay attention. Nothing I said to you has been self-serving. It's all been how to enhance your wins. I said, but excuse the language. I said, we're so busy masturbating each other, making each other feel good, that we can't even talk to each other no more. And unfortunately, the things that we need to do sometimes hurt. But the pain is often the pain we project on ourselves, not the pain they give to us. Like, I can't hurt you. If I say, you ain't shit, and I call, I use all kind of derogatory words after that, it's what you do with those words that hurt yourself. I can't hurt you. That's why when people run around here talking about, you know, it hurt me when this actor said this to me, or uh, Chappelle hurt me when he made his comment about trans. No, you hurt yourself. You just use Dave Chappelle as a focus point, right? These are things, and I know this stuff is not, you're going to find out later on as we teach that sometimes things can be rational, but just not reasonable. I mean, yeah, you know it's right, but picture your mouth, you're going to still shoot me. <laughs> like, like you just say what you want to say, right? What I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is that, but you still want to start developing this strength. Because even when I hear feedback, I get a little, I get a little, I get a little, like a little twitch for a second. And then I got to talk myself off the cliff and go, okay, now that's going to hurt. I accept the pain. But sit your ass here and don't you say not a goddamn word. And in your head, you're going to already be ready prepared to debate and tell the person, fuck what you said, right? But also, also, I do consider who's giving me advice. I go consider your angle, contextually, where you're coming from. Sometimes people give me advice because they, they're they seeking, they feel inferior because of the conversation. Man, let's say if I told you, hey, the reason you keep falling is because you keep wearing leather bound shoes. You're like, this food don't figure that out. I don't like, I don't, that's why I don't wear tennis shoes. I want these leather ass shoes. So you'll come around and be like, well, Nana, that New York shit you got on, you from Oakland. Well, it's so, okay. So now you're not really, you're not trying to help me. At this point, you feel conquered by that last advice. But a child could give me feedback. So I don't filter who gives it to me, but I do contextually listen and go, hey, why are you telling me this? And if you tell me, you know, I pay attention. If you're wise, I just want to share this with you. That's a gift. Right or wrong, I don't care. Because it could be wrong to me right now, and later on I find out there was some truth in that later on. So I, I store it on my shelves, and I shut the fuck up, right? All of that is increasing awareness, and it's constantly making me happy. When I, when I look at my motorcycles in the garage, I'm going, no, no, why do you still have this fucking motorcycle? What's going on with you? That's all increasing awareness, right? Um, if me and court debate, I don't walk away going, yeah, yeah, I was right. I'm like, hmm, what, 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 was I, what, what, what could I have done differently, right? Now when I'm hanging out with people, it's increasing my empathy. So when I'm watching your facial expression, your emotions, I'm like, okay, I, I know what I'm saying might be right, but it ain't going to work right now. So twist it, curve it, shift it. Uh, throw some roses on, or put some sugar on top of that, and then step the fuck back, give some praise, right? And then cut it halfway, because just leave that little 2%, and let them figure out the other 98%, because that's not your, you're not here to control people, you're here to support people, right? And so, awareness is often um, dampened or reduced because we focus on victimization and outward, like the world's happening to us, not by us. Once we start seeing the world's happening by us, then we'll start seeing ourselves. But when the world's happening to us, you no longer see yourself. You, you become a master judge of everybody else. You can tell everybody what to do with their life, but can't fix yours to save your own motherfucking life. Hmm. And so you got to get to by us, not to us. If you find yourself defensive too much, you in a, you in a to us. The two world's happening to you. There's really, really no, like, if, unless people are coming for you physically, like, for example, the women who, like, can't go outside because of the, the physical danger, that's a different conversation. I'm talking about you in conversation and you're defensive. <laughs> that means you got a fucked up perception of the outside world. You have a fucked up negotiation. What it should be is, huh, I felt that feeling. Huh, that's legit. Like, all your feelings are legitimate. Why do I feel that feeling? 
huh? Okay, first of all, let me see where they're coming from. Wait, why'd you say that? Where are you coming from with it? What's your vision on that? Like, help me insight, because I because I don't want to just okay. I saw I said this sister at the, um the one ones that made cry. And I was like, yo, you can't hear me, sis. Yes, I can. Sis, cut out. You can't hear me. Yes, I can. I said, okay, fuck it. Um, John grabbed his dog, got in his car, and went to the beach. Did you hear what I just said? She said, yeah. I said, no, you didn't. She said, yes, I said, no, the fuck you didn't. She said, yes, I said, okay, so what color was John? What kind, of, what kind of dog did he have? What kind of car did he drive in? Which beach did he go to? So you didn't hear shit. But what you did was you just let me speak and then you told yourself what you wanted to hear. That's the game. And that's the thing we have to realize that that's what makes me more curious. I realize I can't hear you until I start to learn how to ask more questions. Cause in my mind, I'm going to take what you said and then change the characters to fit my story, not your story. That's the power of that shit. Okay. So in that situation, Shakira was curious enough to know why Nzinga was responding that way. And then we take radical, res- we receive the feedback and then we take radical responsibility, like what I did in that situation. Well, so when Shakira, when, I mean, when Shakira started, when um, Zynga, excuse me, not Zynga, when Zynga was in my room acting now, acting like the little girl, I said, babe, this is, this is, this is your fault here. But... Shakira came from a family that they their masters talk about you. They will talk about you as soon as you leave. You about to get it. They are, I get it all the time. I don't even I don't even go over there no more. It's just too much. It's just I ain't shit. But they just, oh we miss you, baby. How you been? Oh my god, we love you. So that so that little door, he ain't shit. All that he think he's doing. You know he need to come to Islam. A lot woo woo wop wop the wham 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 right. He don't see me. He doesn't. So she's been raised that her whole life. Now she's she's making it a focus of hers to shift that mind state. But those are comfortable habits. It's a lot to say about comfort. When something's a comfortable habit, it becomes becomes unnoticed because it doesn't create any type of energy field in your body, right? If you're doing something bad, but you got you grew up in something bad your whole life, there's nothing. There's no triggers in your brain going, ah, I probably should do that, right? You have to consciously get manual with it for a little while until it becomes almost organic in this process. And so in the end, the reason she's willing to hear me so quickly would I even, she'd go, mm, okay. It's not that she's not debating or, or discussing, but the reason she doesn't in- immediately defend herself because she knows that's one of her blind space spots and there ain't no space for her to talk about it, right? Or if I came over like, you can't cook, First of all, I ain't saying that. But number two, and I don't even want to imply that because the food at the house be off the chains. But if I said that, then then she would say, what the fuck are you saying? The fuck made you say that? Because she knows that's an area that she feels strong in and she has no reason to doubt it. And so at the end of the day, like you have to become aware that, okay, I'm kind of weak in these areas. I saw also like when you, that ego's kicking in strong it's telling you great out of everything you do and you kind of good or you good enough or you should be respected because at least you can do it. You can't receive feedback. You got to be able to say, I actually suck. Like when I put together my home theater, I put together home theaters before. But I knew damn well, I don't know. All, like if you if you, if you turn the box over and just start reading those words off to me, I'd be like, crossover, 80 hertz, 120 hertz. What the fuck? Is that? All right, I'm going to plug this here. It's red go red, black go black. Turn that shit on. Here's something. It worked, right? I started reading. I started learning about that shit. I realized you really didn't know shit. Somebody should have sued your ass. I, matter of fact, I got shit in my house that I'm going to go home and fix as it's all backwards, right? But, like, I had to sit there and learn about it. But I had to say to myself before it got started, which is I could have easily brought it to my pride. I know what I'm doing. I've done it before. I, I don't spend my money for money. I know what the fuck I'm doing. But first thing I said was, do you really know what you're doing? So I gave, like, maybe seven, eight hours of just learning about the shit. And then after a while, I was like, oh, shit. I do that all the time. And she can't tell you, like, I'm the king of that shit. When I want to do something I really want to do, and I've done it before. I asked myself, are you really good, though? Mm-hmm. Are you really? Could you compete at this level? If not, what would it hurt you just to go back and learn? So just having that kind of approach of, of self-honesty, stop focusing on outside people, outside solutions. Um, no, diamond ring don't make you feel better if it does. You're in a bad space. No, 
uh, if this person gives you something that you always wanted, that's not going to change your life. No, if he marries you, nope, ain't going to make your life. No, If you wasn't happy already, him marrying you ain't going to do no goddamn thing for you. Um, no, uh, if white people just leave the neighborhood and let you take it all back, no, they ain't going to do nothing for you either. Uh, no, if white people just apologize for slavery, nope. Like all that shit, these stories we tell ourselves, all these external powers that's going to change our life, stop it. The power is inside of us. So it's nine o'clock. So we're going we gonna to come to a, a conclusion, but I just want you guys to really um, think about the shit that we've been, been working on the six months. Put it into your undercurrent, right? Stress plus nutrients equals growth. So that even ties into the compound interest ideal is, is as long as you have nutrients and stress in your life on your path, you're going to get there. You're going to get there. But this can't stop after today. Like, okay, now we're going to get into strategy. That emotional, emotional agility, those tools have to be in your undercurrent and think about it. That's how compound, compound interest works. If, if I go back to my high school right now and, and even and told them what I do right now, they wouldn't believe it. I was in the slow class with the disabled kids my high school career because I was an at-risk kid who they thought was stupid. So we had the same classroom for four periods. I can't believe that shit. With the Serenios and the Nathaniels and the, the people who spoke English as a different language and all the hood kids that they didn't want to be a part of. And I, w yeah. I did that for my high school year. I can't believe But that what shit. compound interest does is just say, huh, one book, two books, three books, four books, five books, five years later, 10 years later, 15 years later. That's the real. That's the real. So it's motherfuckers are not smarter than you. I guarantee you that. It's what practice have you been putting in an application have you been putting in in your journey to be an entrepreneur? What have you practiced? And I guarantee you, once you practice it and put it in your undercurrent, that's where the compound interest starts because it bleeds off into everything you do. It affects everything you do. When you gain 10% interest on a dollar, you're no longer gaining 10% interest on a dollar no more. You're gaining 10% interest on a dollar ten. You see what I'm saying? So that's how compound interest works. I'm excited to, to I'm excited as fuck for the next for the next six months. Um, and um, I guess that's it. Oh, oh, real quick, with the books we're gonna be so, um, the book that we're gonna treat as a podcast for the next month and a half is gonna be the psychology of money. The books that we're gonna be working out of is factfulness. Um, um, Han, Hans something. Let me see. I'll say. Factfulness. Um, got too many damn books in my goddamn library. By Hans Rosling. So Factfulness is going to be the book, and we're working two books at the same time. Another book is going to be The uh, the Great Mental Model, uh, Volume 1. Um, and... Um, yeah, I think that's, that's yes, Volume 1. I think it's that's going to be... Um, Yeah, so the Great Mental Mind is by Shane Parrish. Great Mental Model, Volume 1. Um, we're going to send out an email with that same verification. Um, we're going to be moving aggressively, so if you don't read the book material, I'm going to lose you after the second class. Um, I'm going to introduce so many strategies and te techniques to you. I'm going to change your core principles. Uh, we're going to get deeper into like things like these compounding, but we're going to get into so many different principles so many different um, ways to look. Matter of fact, after, and after the next two months, you probably won't be able to watch TV the same ever again. Ever. Ever. You won't be able to read newspapers the same again. Ever. It's going to make you so... But you're going to feel like the world is your playground. You can do what you want to do. It's going to make you feel like you have a superpower. And once you go to work, um, you're going to start to hear, you're going to start to hear the people talking a different language that you didn't know was existed around you this whole time. You'll hear key buzzwords that you never heard before. You'll hear principles being echoed. 
around you that you're like, they've been saying this the whole time. I didn't hear it. It's crazy what you get. And then, then you'll know when you're out and about who to stop and have a conversation with when you want to extract because you can hear it in their words. You can hear it in their, the way that they're showing up to certain ideas. So those two books we're going to be working really, really fast out of. Uh, I will be tapping. I will be. I will be tapping with a couple of. Every week I'm going to work on the 15 core kind of the distortions. So each week I'm going to take two. And each week I'm going to deliver hardcore business development strategies. So like if you're literally building a business, these are hardcore things you have to understand. Matter of fact, some of you after this after this six next six months, if you read this material. You can literally go out and, a, be a, and build a, a career as a consultant. So I'm going to give you more than most most consultants even come close to having. And the goal of this is because in the end, I want to empower everybody in this room to do what the fuck they want to do, to be who they want to be. And I want you to have the tools and the power. I want you to move away from blaming to actually seeing the pathway to do. So with that being said, we got next week off, all right? Next week is off? Is it right? We off next week? Yeah. Okay, so we're off next week. I'm going to be working on my movie theater. And um, y'all have a good weekend. I'm not sending y'all no damn podcast. It's the book, The Psychology of Money. It's going to change everything for you. So with that being said, as they say in Brooklyn, see y'all in a minute. Peace. <laughs>